Good evening. I'd like to call the select board meeting of October 29th, 2018 to order at 6.32 p.m. Um, just a quick opening remarks, uh, announcements, and agenda review. Um, we'll take our, our uh, agenda pretty much in order. We have a couple of public hearings this evening at 6.45 and 7. We'll do public comment before that. We may, depending on how much public comment, be able to, to sneak in a couple of small items before that. But one thing that I want to make sure that we do um, for public comment, and uh, there were significant events over the weekend, uh, particularly in the Pittsburgh area, and uh, if we could, I would like to take a, a moment of silence uh, to uh, honor the victims of, of that tragic event. So if we could just take a moment, please. Thank you. Um, it's. Uh, you know, there are lots of those kinds of events that happen, but it's, uh, you know, uh, when people are at their house of worship, it's a little more difficult. So I'd like to know if there's anyone here for public comment other than an item that's on the agenda. Yes? So if you'd like to come to the mic and tell us who you are and why you're here, we usually limit our public comment to about three minutes or so, and then uh, we usually don't necessarily, it's just general rules of thumb, we don't generally respond to that. It's not that we don't want to hear what, we absolutely want to hear what you have to say, but we also just want to, uh, you know, take it into advisement and we'll go from there. Okay. May I have permission to just share some absolutely. paper with you? Does that have to come to one person? May I have permission to share this handout with all of you? Absolutely. So just hand it to yeah. one person. Hand it to our clerk and <laughs> we'll pass them around. So good evening. I'm here as Claudia Pasmani, resident and uh, board president of Big Brothers Big Sisters of Hampshire County. Hi, everyone. I'm Jesse Cooley. I'm the director of Big Brothers Big Sisters of Hampshire County. We've just shared with you some photos of people in our program who are involved in Amherst matches here. And we're here to advocate for our program to receive some of the funding committed to community services in May of this year. The motion at the May 2nd town meeting raised a community service budget by $60,000. It is our understanding that the money has to be spent for community services. The intent on May 2nd was clear that the motioner and the town meeting members voted for that money to be put to use into and invested into youth services. The motioner referenced the fact that while two youth programs in towns had applied for funding in 2018 through the community development block grant process, both were left out. The town meeting members voted strongly in favor of this additional 60,000 in funding, showing clear support for youth services in Amherst. We ask that you consider making some of this funding available for Big Brothers Big Sisters of Hampshire County in order that other youth in the program and other youth programs in Amherst as well. I'll let Jesse talk about what we actually do and where that money goes. So at Big Brothers Big Sisters, we match children with mentors who provide friendship and guidance and support as well as new opportunities for their mentees. Our mentees or our littles get to experience athletic events, music and art performances. They try new things like cooking and hiking with their bigs and they spend time on the college campuses exploring and becoming comfortable in the higher ed setting. They have someone in their corner and this has a powerful impact. Our littles are far less likely to skip school or engage in other risky behaviors. They're significantly more likely than their peers to graduate from high school and go on to higher education. They are 78% more likely to volunteer regularly and 130% more likely to become leaders in their community. So this is a true community service and benefit that our program provides. And our town businesses and the community as a whole benefits from this program. We have bigs who are business owners here in Amherst who've been matched multiple times because they experience firsthand the importance of this program. And they've received the one-to-one -one support from our staff to ensure that the match is a good fit. And our staff connects with them regularly throughout the match uh, to make sure that we have the best possible outcomes. And I just wanna share proudly that our uh, match support is really second to none here in our Amherst program. We far exceed the national average for the length of our matches and for their high quality. 
So we're lucky, I'll keep going, to have the community allies that we do. Many of you may have come to our Daffodil Run in the spring. The community really comes together and rallies behind our program to make sure that the young people in our town have the support they need. We're really grateful for that. In 2017, we were awarded $37,000 in funding from CDBG. Um, we we're very thankful for that. We served 101 Amherst children in that grant period. And we have strong partnerships with the Amherst Regional Public Schools and with UMass Amherst and Amherst College that help make all of that possible. So we intended to do the same thing this coming year, serving the same number. But uh, as we mentioned, we didn't receive any funding uh, for the 2018-2019 cycle. We have 69 children currently on the wait list in Amherst. And more are being referred by the schools each week. It's a true hardship for us to have lost funding for this year. And again, we hope you will consider making some of these additional community services funds available to your community youth programs. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is there other public comment not related to an agenda item? All right. I think we have a few moments before we start our our 645 hearing or continuation of a hearing we had uh, last week. So I think it's an opportunity to do a couple of specific uh, licenses and public way types of things. And so I believe uh, I'll ask Ms. LaCour to come up and talk about uh, the Mary Maple Street closure and parking reservation and the district holiday parking, including the Pack the Sack <coughs> Saturday parking reservation. So if you'd like to, to give a little advertisement for both of those. Um, and also just tell us about you know the sort of need you have specifically which i think you've articulated in your in your request but great thank you very much um sarah lacour executive director of the amherst business improvement district and with me claudia Mas pasmani with a different hat from 10 seconds ago <laughs> um yes we have made a couple different requests mary maple this year is um, a little bit earlier it's friday november 30th um this year the first of December fell on a Saturday so but uh, it's our usual request uh, with the Chamber of Commerce uh, that the um, parking lots the Spring Street lot and the Main Street lot be closed for a period of time for um, the Spring Street lot would be for the Muddy Brook Farm wagon rides and the Main Street lot would be for people to gather and um, have donuts and hot chocolate and listen to music and wait for the actual lighting of the tree and wait for the marching band with Santa in the fire truck. Um, so all of those wonderful events will be taking place again. So that's um, our usual request for that event. Um, do you want me to speak about the other? Okay, well, all at once. Uh, so then also we have made, the, the bid has made uh, a request that we have made in previous years for uh, Saturdays, for free parking on Saturdays. Um, we have requested this year to start with the Saturday after Thanksgiving, which is Small Business Saturday. And then the following Saturday, December 1st, is our Pack the Sack event, which is now an annual event. This is our third year of that event. And um, it's the former greeting card day, if anybody's familiar with that. Uh, so it is a little bit, um, uh, different we took that event over and called it pack the sack we actually will have sacks associated with that event this year um, <laughs> which will be available at the visitor center and some other locations so that's five saturdays from saturday the 24th of november through i believe it's the 22nd of december um, that we're requesting um, free parking on saturdays uh, i think i think was that the request <laughs> thank you very much do we have questions for the folks that are bringing this? Ms. Kruger, please. So parking on Saturdays, this isn't just for this year, but over the last couple of years, I've never understood what the free parking does besides say you can park here for free. I, is there any data that says that people come here more for free parking or that you can't find a place to park because people have decided to park in those spaces for free all day. So I feel very conflicted and not just this year, each year when this comes up, I don't understand the purpose, uh, the effect of the free parking in some real way besides we're deferring parking revenue but I don't really see what the benefit is besides saying, hey, come to Amherst, it's free parking but I don't think it helps people find places to park. So um, we do not have data, but 
what we are working with is a perception issue. Uh, at this time of year, the malls are free parking with lots of it. And uh, there are other communities. Uh, Northampton has the first hour free in their parking garage, things like that. Uh, so it is a perception issue that, yes, there will be folks that perhaps stay all day, but generally that's not common. And we believe that it is sort of giving us equal playing field with the malls uh, and getting folks downtown. Um, I'd like to try to get some more data on it, and perhaps this year we can do that. Uh, I know parking is a hot button issue, um, but that said, for this year we would like to have the perception that we are open for business and that parking um, as sort of a gift to shoppers, if you will, um, is, is free at those times. So I, I, I I understand completely, and you know, I'm with you that it's it's a it's a double-edged sword. But um, that's our request, and that's that's why we're why we're doing it. So, of course, I'm compelled to note that the gift you're giving is the town's revenue, not <laughs> your revenue. <laughs> so, um, understood. Yeah. Uh, that that phrasing is just a little bit difficult, and we've. He's tried to, to collect data associated with this in the past, but there has, in terms of what we would be losing over that period of time, that was done many years ago. But of course, one of the things is, since we've been doing it for a long time, it's, we don't really have a baseline to compare it to because those holiday weekends are different than any other time of year from that standpoint. One thing that's also come up in the past is the idea of whether or not we would still enforce the time limits on the meters, and so I'd just like to get a sense from the town manager what our plan is associated with that. I don't necessarily feel one way or the other about it. It's just I worry when it's not clear to people what the expectation is. So I think what you said is precisely true, because when we advertise free parking, people interpret that as free parking, not free time-limited parking. Um, I honestly don't know what, I don't think we've enforced time limits in the past, in previous years. Um, and that resulted when you talk to business owners, they will tell you that employees are parking right in front of their stores for long periods of time. So I think that's what Ms. LaCour was pointing out was that it, it may not be a practical good thing, but that um, percept for, per from perception and for advertising, it does convey a more welcoming approach to free parking downtown. But the question would be, do we enforce the time limits? And I don't think we have in the past. Um, because I think that would sort of, um, you wind up with a ticket and people don't think, hey, I got free parking, I think it creates confusion for people. I understand what you're saying completely, but we have mm -hmm. actually tried to do it in the past and it's been really unclear to people because there was a miscommunication where some people assumed that it meant free but still limited in order to ensure that turnover, which while on the one hand what you said is totally logical it's free it's free on the other hand parking is limited by time normally and so to assume that it's okay to park there all day is yet another issue so hopefully this is something that can be looked at more strategically in the future but in the meantime it doesn't feel like this is the year to make a change to any of those policies to me but i, th I think we have shared these concerns repeatedly, and we don't really seem to have a way forward of dealing with them. But at least we're making it, trying to make it clear what people can expect. Mr. Seinberg. Yeah, I guess as a general matter, and I'll say this to, for both the bid and the chamber, um, you know, we're uh, going forward, um, the town not the select board, but the town as a whole is going to have to look again at the question of just general parking policies and how we balance the goals of getting turnover in spaces in order to um, make sure that when people come to town that they can find a space and then there's this perception of freeness and um, they don't go together necessarily. And there's a lot of data collection that needs to take place in order to really see what is happening and to have an understanding about that. So uh, we're making a motion on the first of the two items. I just urge that um, we find a way that we can get 
help from your organizations, which are really the key communicators working with the business community to help us, as being the town, work with the business community to assess those things. With that, um, I'm going to at least start on the first of the requests and make a motion regarding uh, <coughs> the Mary Maple event, if the chair so wishes. It's Okay, I move to approve the Amherst Chamber of Commerce and Business Improvement District's request for reservation of metered parking and street closure for the Mary Maple Tree Lighting Ceremony on Friday, November 30, 2018, as follows. Close the Main Street parking lot from 2 p.m. to 6.30 p.m. Close the Spring Street parking lot from 1 p.m. to 6.30 p.m. Close Boltwood Avenue between the Lord Jeffrey. Make sure we get that between the Lord Jeffrey and then Main Street, from 2 p.m. to 6:30 p.m. Close Spring Street from Boltwood Avenue to Churchill Street, including the Spring Churchill intersection, 2 p.m. to 6:30 p.m. to allow for horse-drawn carriage rides. Second. So a motion and a second. <coughs> Is there further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? So that's unanimous with one member absent. I'd entertain the other motion if you'd like to make that as well. Yeah, I move to approve the Business Improvement District's request for free parking throughout the downtown Amherst area at all meters and in all the parking lots with pay-by-space parking machines, Boltwood Garage, Amity Street, Spring Street Lot, Main Street Lot, Town Hall in the town portion of the CVS lot on Saturdays between Saturday, November 24, 2018, through Saturday, December 22, 2018. Is there a second? I'll second, and then I have a comment. Okay. Go ahead. One of the things we've, we've wordsmithed a little bit in the past, although I really appreciate that staff pulled out exactly what we did last year, that's incredibly helpful, um, is the idea that, you know, do all the meters that we have and all the parking machines we have count as downtown? And now that we have some on Olympia Drive, I guess. Right. That makes things a little more complicated. Right. So we don't want to make those free. And so I guess I appreciate that it says downtown Amherst, but what it really means is basically everything other than what's on Olympia Drive is my understanding. It's just so it's right. clear that if you want to park way down in front of Emily, if you're willing to park that far and walk, it's free there too. And not everyone considers that as downtown as parking in front of this building and all the way down to Prey Street, et cetera. So just to be clear, that we're all on the same page there. Okay. Is there further discussion? If um, yes. Ms. Brewer thought it advisable, we could amend the motion very slightly by saying throughout downtown Amherst area, comma, south of Triangle Street. Ooh, that would work. Um, comma. Works. If we added those words, that would um, address the one vagueness that you were pointing out. Then I would, uh, with the seconder's agreement, uh, propose to amend the motion I made to add those words. All right. If that's agreeable to seconder, which I believe it is, then we'll have that as the motion that we're considering. Is there further discussion? <clears throat> Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed? Abstaining. I'm opposed? abstaining. Abstaining, okay. So we have a uh, three to one abstention and one ab absent. Thank you both very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. So we've just passed 645, so I think we'll take up our, uh, we'll resume our public hearing from, from last week. Um, I guess we, do we formally reopen it, I guess. It's still open. It's just been continued since so right. you closed the public hearing. So you, but you can still deliberate. No, we did not. No, we, close no, we, the we, we continued. We did not it. close the hearing. They had, had a motion on it. Mm -hmm. Motion to continue it, we I continued. think. Continue. Right. Okay. At 6:45.
So we should rewrite <laughs> whatever that says, because okay. that was our clear intention. So four of us are remembering it. We, <laughs> we continued the hearing. <laughs> uh, so we'll reopen the hearing at 6.52 p.m. And so if the if Ms. Bone would like to come forward for us and we had a few questions and that sort of thing. And I have a revised plot plan, floor plan, and elevation drawings. I was not able to get these in digital format. The architect was trying to get them into PDF and her technology failed her. So I have one set of full size drawings for you um, and I can send you electronic versions of these, but you're going to have to share. Um, actually, I've got one set for myself and one set for you, so I could give you two if you want one for each side. Um, if you want to just give it to Mr. Stein. Yeah, if that's okay. And would, do you like to look at it, uh, Ms. Brewer, because you're the one who usually finds the details for us? <laughs> uh, I'll come with later. Tom from the Design Review Board mm -hmm. who approved the paint color oh, with some reservations. And um, after that? Yes. I was wondering about that. It will be reviewed uh, in coming years and the color may be toned uh, back a little bit. But paint first, ask later. Well, yes. Um, the other thing I have multiple copies of for you is the manager application section of the um, application. I emailed this earlier today, but we have detail on Mr. Annunziata's past, really project history. He's been self-employed. He has a, that's why he can give all copies to the clerk. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. and then we pass them. Yeah. Just give them, give them to me and then I'll pass them around for you so you can continue on. <laughs> it's too chaotic. And the other thing I made multiple copies of is this, is the guts of the application itself because the floor, the, the square footage and occupancy numbers have finally been taken off of the, of the drawings that we have of the floor plan. So that's been revised. Um, the lease information has been modified just a little bit. The contribution cost is at $50,000. He miscalculated it when he first submitted it. Um, and other than that, there aren't any ch other changes, but it's just, it's tight. Parts that are handwritten have been tight now. So Mr. Clark. Questions? Yeah. 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 One for yourself. So I believe when we were here before, you had concerns about his employment history. Those have been. Um, hopefully being addressed, and the, uh, the seating plan uh, was your other concern. This plot plan shows the outside seating, and the only access, I just finished doing the ZBA application, so the only access to the outside seating areas is from inside the building. Those areas are gated, um, and the management plan for the ZBA um, you know, will require that that be policed and, and very heavily monitored so that there aren't problems with alcohol going places other than the premises where it's licensed to be. Uh, I don't know what other questions or details you might want to. There are two right? sections. So all right, if I'm I could ask some clarifying yes, questions sure. as sure. we're trying to sort out all this paper because yes. although we got some additional yeah. things in our packet, we did not get the employment history. And so, so we're just looking at that areas. now for the first time. So we need some reading the, time. The yep. um, in addition to that, we should obviously look at the plans, whatever Mr. Steinberg and Ms. Kruger just found. But I want to clarify something you just said. I was familiar with the previous seating along the side that was gated, but we're talking about adding additional seating that's no. also gated because it says new exterior seating. It's, it's, it's different tables, but it's the same area. It's the same part of the building that Bertucci's had been permitted before. He's just putting picnic tables in instead of the type of tables that Bertucci's had. It's exactly the same space. I'm, I'm confused by that because I only remember there being seating along the parking lot, not on the end of the building, and there are tables here that say there are tables on the end of the building. I don't believe that was previously. It was permitted by the ZBA in 1994. I don't believe it was alcohol licensed by this Okay, board. I don't know that. That's where the difference. Okay. 
lies. Wow, this is really confusing. Okay. It wasn't the licensed premises for alcohol at that time. The side is because of the way the gating works, but this side is going to have Okay, so I'm confused. So the end of the building, which does not, did not, under its most recent iteration, have seating where people were being served alcohol. That was simply the outside of the building. The side part was the part that was gated. That was the part on the parking lot. It was a nice long stretch. You got in from the inside. It was clearly controlled, as we talk about CBA. That was a licensed premise. We're talking about adding tables now on the end of the building, if I'm looking at this map correctly, on that's, that's on the Pleasant Street side. And I'm trying to understand if those are there are new gates around there that you are taking to the ZBA. That's been, an, that's been a gated area since the building was built. It was originally built as a bocce court. There's no outside access in there. There's a gate, I think there's an escape gate, but you can't just walk into that part of the building. There's about a four foot high or three foot high brick wall surrounding it. And you can get at it from inside of the dining area, but you can't get at it from the street. So it's a controlled area. I don't know. I didn't. I don't have access. I didn't have access to the former liquor license, so I can't tell you what if if it wasn't permitted under the previous liquor license. I wasn't aware of that. Um, but it was per, it was permitted by the ZBA as a, as outside seasonal dining area. Um, so and it is it is, you know. Is, is, and it, as a practical matter, I don't think Bertucci's ever actually used it for outside seasonal dining because I don't know why, but they didn't. That being my point, yeah. we've never actually had food in the 20 years I've lived here served on that end of the building, nor alcohol, because nothing's been served on that end of the building outside. That's what I'm trying to get at. I appreciate that the ZBA may have allowed for it in the past, and potentially the old liquor license did too, even though we never thought about it because we never saw it being used because it wasn't being used. So it is a different to us in terms of at least practical experience, even if the original liquor license did show it as licensed premises, which we don't know. Um, I just want to be clear in our own process, since this is a new liquor license application, does it really matter? It's new to it, it wouldn't matter. I wasn't here in 1994 or whatever. What we're looking at is whether it's appropriate to have the alcohol license include alcohol service for an outdoor Sorry. area and questions about whether it can be separated and not accessed from, you know, any point on the sidewalk. But, I mean, looking at how it will be kept for um, people who have come in and have had their IDs checked and not just people wandering about. So I, I don't, well, I appreciate your point. I, I'm not sure it matters to us because we're looking at everything before us and deciding if it should be included in the liquor license that we're being asked to grant. Right? I simply, Obviously, but I can't perceive that it works the same way as it currently did because it doesn't. It, the, what's well, being proposed is different, and that's what proposal. I'm trying to understand. Because I, I cannot envision those gates, and I did not drive down there because I right. did not know that that was going to be part of the plan. And maybe, so that's a little, that's maybe, just maybe something Maybe the new. applicant could point out the gate, how that functions, because I can't really see it on the plan, like where the door and the... How it's secured off, I, I can't tell. But this is more secure than the front. I can tell you, having been there, this is more secure than the front patio area in front um, of the spoke. But could you point out how how it functions? Sure. So on this plan. No, you don't have boards or slides, but this elevation drawing. The last sheet that you have. Yep. You look at the last page in the mm -hmm. lower drawing. Yep. Got it. Um, there's a brick wall that runs practically the entire width, the low brick wall that runs practically the sure. entire width of the building. That encloses that whole patio area. Um, the only way to get in there is through the doors outside, coming from the inside of the building going out. You cannot access that area from the sidewalk. And there's plants in the brick wall, so it's actually pretty well screened from the street. Um, can, can you, are the doors the ones that have the, the hatched diagonal lines? 
Yes, That's those are I the really those are the exit doors coming out of the restaurant, going into the into the. Uh, so there's two of patio. them. Yes, on either right. side of those posters. That's one correct. One is one is uh, just being familiar with the building. There's a small like private party room not anymore as you oh. walk in and that's got one door to that yeah. and then there's one that's in the whatever okay. it's not the lobby area okay. but the waiting area in the so previous what restaurant so was that private room is now more integrated i believe and actually if you look at the <laughs> sorry the second sheet which is the floor plan shows very clearly how that area thank is you. constructed this was the private yeah, any room half but thank you that's really helpful the floor plan um, in the, in the, the far left side of the floor plan shows that um, that outside patio area with the two doors from the inside of the building going out there. There's an emergency exit um, off that patio, but it's not it's not open to the public. It's only if you know there's a fire and they, people need it because otherwise you'd have to climb over the brick wall to. Uh, and am I reading this? Oh, I'm sorry. Mr. Yes, please. Am I reading this correctly that where what was what we were calling the private dining room that that wall that wall is being removed? That's the dark hatched line that goes through the table. That's, that's correct. Actually, because um, see if that yeah it says existing partitions to be removed. Okay, that's helpful since we're seeing this for the first time. So there's time. really more visibility. The place is wide open on so the inside. We need to be walked through some of this. Yes, we just got this. I, I understand. I did too. Just get it. I so. know, but that's <laughs> yeah. But that's your job. Yes, I know. <laughs> um, and the outside, the you know, the, the the parking lot side, outside dining, if you will, shows there's two, two entrances from the inside, and then no, no outside access. So, and um, how tall is the little brick wall? Three feet, four feet. It's, I think it's close to forty-two inches. Close to forty-two inches. He thinks. Yeah. No, you can't just like, it's not something you could hop over easily yeah, yeah. without That's what I'm asking. Yeah. Great. Okay. Yeah. Other questions? And the entrance is, you know, there's only really the only one way in. Just like a couple more minutes to read the other sure work absolutely to us. that's why i'm not really pressing to move ahead i'm just because <laughs> i figured yeah. that folks need a moment to mm -hmm. to read through some of the newer stuff we got tonight um do you fellows on the end want to look at these or are you you're good oh, right. i could share I would <laughs> so i'm imagining it from the description i can give you my set but then i don't have anything to refer to <laughs> <laughs> take, take, take a gander take a quick look at it thank you yeah, the floor plan's probably got the clearest depiction of this is, that's north, right? So that's the area that's so this they're taking out. Oh, I see they're gonna extend the bar all the way around. So, Mr. Slaughter. Yes. Um, I mean, it's my general observation that there are other restaurants in town with outdoor seating areas. Um, won't name what they are, but they serve alcohol and they're in the downtown area. And I don't think that they have any um, better separation. And sometimes it may be less secure separation than is being proposed here. And um, 
I, I decided to say it now and not wait until the close of the hearing because I noticed that the police chief was present and um, I'm not, a, I haven't heard that there are any problems that exist with um, alcohol um, being passed between people who are being served after being uh, properly identified for uh, qualification for purchase and other people because of those locations um, proximity to passers-by on the street um, and so if we if if my perception is correct then um, I'm not sure that we should be treating this restaurant differently than we've treated other restaurants right I, I would agree I think that you know the the questions we raise I think are just in getting a sense of it you know to to see if it has a similar setup or a different setup than than some of those other restaurants that you you identify actually if, if the chief could come to the mic and I'll ask you guys to separate sure. for a little bit so that he can step up I I think we did have a question or two for him, but I also just to that question in particular, sort of what's the experience you've had relative to other outdoor dining spaces that serve alcohol, have we had any issues with those um, that you're aware of or any you know, control or, or other kinds of issues relative to those outdoor circumstances? Yeah, nothing, um, Mr. Slaughter, nothing that I can think of recently. Um, it was an issue maybe 20, 25 years ago with a location called Twister's Tavern, which occupied the um, patio kind of adjacent to Johnny's. It's no longer uses that type of a uh, facility or, or nobody's actually using it as outdoor dining or service of alcohol. But the other locations I can think of that have outdoor service, um, the Spoke, the Pub, High Horse, the Hangar. Um, no, no issues there. It's good to know. Did we have other questions for the chief? Before? Since we've got him at the mic, I think there were <clears throat> some questions we had posed last week relative to, can you just you know, sort of paint the picture of your process? You know, so we had, by virtue of you know, the application having some places that uh, didn't have things filled in, we were sort of curious as to how your piece of the, of the application process had gone ahead without having that information. So, We've kind of heard bits and pieces about how that happens without the, you know, the sort of ABCC forms being filled out fully. And so can you just kind of paint that picture for us a little bit about how you guys do your due diligence on these kinds of license applications? Sure. So um, the information that we need is typically, um, you know, na obviously names, dates of birth, locations of uh, addresses, social security numbers. And then we have a one, two, three, four um, software companies that we use to do background investigations on liquor license checks, um, New England State Police Information Networks, which is New England wide. Of course, we do everything local and, and statewide as well. We do board of probation checks, which would bring up any kind of criminal history throughout the country. Uh, we do um, interstate identification checks, which uh, again is nationwide and some international. And we do Cleary reports, which is a software company we utilize that give us background histories and background uh, red flags, if there are any red flags on financial stuff. If there are any red flags on any of these types of checks that we do, we contact the local law enforcement agency, request reports, and any information they would have on that individual or that uh, previous uh, location of where they've done business. Um, you know, we do social media checks. Uh, it's pretty extensive. Um, we don't usually go to locations to check, you know, uh, job app, you know, job, previous job employment, unless they're really, we've done it locally before. We had an applicant who was from the Springfield area that was denied um, based on a board of probation check, but typically we wouldn't send somebody to New Jersey or Florida or that look type of location. Okay. Any questions for the chief? Yes. One of the things I was trying to understand, and, and Mr. Bachman may have explained this to you, is that because there is a phrase in ABCC law that about good character, but yet it's never been clear how the mm -hmm. local licensing authority is supposed to establish that, um, we do heavily depend on the work of, of your force. And one of the things that we were concerned about, or certainly I was, was that without having provided any employment history, it made, although certainly 
date of birth, SSN could mm -hmm. lead you to those things. It was not as likely that, say, for example, where this uh, the only restaurant experience recently is 2017 to present, that you could feel easily able to call up the local licensing authority or the police authority in that community and say, have you had any issues? with this individual as a liquor license holder, if that was true. And so it was confusing to me that without having that information, how you would be able to decide if you wanted to do that level of check. And from what you're saying, it sounds like um, the connections are extensive enough between the different software programs that the employment history would have popped up with that. And so if you were to choose to follow that up, you would have had that available to you. That's correct. I mean, if there are red flags, I mean, I mean, I don't want to generalize, but um, in the restaurant field, there's a lot of individuals in the restaurant field. That's the field they're in for extended periods of time. So there may not be an extensive um, history of employment, I guess, to check on. But um, my, I'm more concerned. I'm more concerned when I sign my name off on a, on a liquor license uh, about criminal history. It's not so much as the labor history part of it. So, but if there are red flags that would usually kick in for things like bankruptcy or money fraud, laundering or fraud, those would be the types of things that we would do extensive investigations on on that. If I could follow up on that. So, um, I don't recall if a liquor license is even held at this other restaurant, but if it were, I don't know that any red flags would appear anywhere. They may not. And so um, that, that was one of the questions I had. Is this yeah. one thing when you know people in Springfield and right. you can call them up and say, what's, what's the happen? But it's always trickier out of state. We understand that. Yeah. And we understand that that may not appear. But I appreciate that you've indicated that you're, you're focusing generally on criminal history and, and specific financial right. problems that would flag in the various softwares. Exactly. Okay. Any other questions for the chief since we have him? Thank you. You bet. What is a public hearing? Is there anyone from the public that wanted to offer any comment or, or information for us? No one's required, obviously. I want to give that opportunity to folks. Um, so has everyone had an opportunity to look through the, the newest materials, or do we want another minute or two to kind of so someone needs to figure out a diff, uh, to how to add all the material to the motion about the licensed premises. Yes. Because it's, that's not, that's not, you don't write our motion. <laughs> I'm saying <laughs> that may be well described somewhere that we can just lift it from, but it's not currently in the motion that someone would have made if they. The description of premises on the revised application contains that. Excellent. To the motion language. Are we to a place where we're ready to close the hearing, or shall we leave it open? From, from I move to close the public hearing. Thank you. Second. Is there further discussion about the closing of the hearing? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 And so the hearing itself is closed at 715, which I will note. And so now we can fine tune our motion <laughs> if someone's found the appropriate so why don't I just read it off and see how it flows and then we yeah. can fix it because I'm looking at the description of premises on page one numbered one not actual page one of the replacement that we received tonight so I move to approve a new all alcohol license for VMS Pizza One doing business as Porta LLC 51 East Pleasant Street Monday through Saturday, 11 a.m. to 1 a.m. the following day, and Sunday noon to 1 a.m. the following day. The premises, and you, somebody can stick it in a different spot because it's been a while since we did a new one like this, um, being a single-story building with bar and table seating, dining area, kitchen, storage, and restrooms, interior dining area, 2850 square feet, exterior seasonal di outdoor dining on two patios, 1,027 square feet, Richard and Ziato, manager. So it's, it's DBA Porta, not Porta LLC. Okay, we had it as LLC in our motion, so thank you for noticing that. Thank you for that. And so that was a second? I was a second, yeah. Okay. I wanted to hear it change. 
So we have a motion and a second. Mr. Bachman, please. Uh, I just ask the applicant to clarify the square footage in the interior dining area. Interior dining area is 20, 2,850 square feet. The total square footage of the building is 7,607, but okay. that's not all dining area. That's okay. kitchen and bathroom. I was just so going with the text yes, description. No, double checking that. The text description is the, is the dining area with seating that's. that's okay. Thank you for that. Um, yes. Now that I'm looking again at the business entity information, should I have said, because the business entity information says VMS Pizza One LLC. Yes. We don't, so that's the where, LLC needs to be in the other spot. Okay. <laughs> Move it yes. VMS Pizza One LLC doing right. business as Porta. Yes. Thank, Thank you. you. That would make sense. That we get. So I'll take that as a friendly amendment. Fine. Second or so. Five. Is there further discussion, or do we think we've wordsmithed this and tortured our applicant? <laughs> no, we're just, I would just say that we're, we're, you know, a lot of this is about our own process and our own sort of due diligence, not necessarily about you per se. So, you know, there are things we want to know about you and your business, and we hope you have the best of success there. Um, but we do want to make sure our I's are dotted and T's are crossed, and we've done our due diligence and served our, the public well for ourselves. Is there further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? That's unanimous with one member absent. Thank you very much. So you can have Connie. this back. Yes, we we we'll have one copy. You want to keep one way. and then send another one back with her? So she has Well, okay. Someone You're going to give her one that one, and we're going to keep yeah. this one. All right. Yeah. Thank you. I just, the last time there was some questions about the food. So I brought the head chef here. Oh, uh, nice. Any questions? His name's Ray. He's got a, a resume. We look, we look, in 1986. I look forward to trying yeah. that food. Uh, yeah. I can't wait to cook for you guys. Right. Thank you. The, uh, question came up during the other license that we grant, which is a common vigilers license, because that's where we talk about the food. This time we're talking about the alcohol. So thank you. I'm going to have a great selection of food. Great. Fantastic. Good. Thank plenty, you. Plenty of vegetarian oh. pitch for vegetarian options. Appreciate your Oh, I got a lot of uh, gluten-free, vegan, a lot of stuff. Good. Keep it all. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. Great. <laughs> so now uh, we'll move on to our 7 p.m. Uh, State Street traffic flow changes, puffer pond parking changes, uh, public hearing. So um, I believe there's a notice I should probably read yes. if I can Does find it in my packet. Mm -hmm. There it is. <clears throat> so this public hearing relates to the following. The Amherst Select Board will hold a public hearing on Monday, October 29, 2018, beginning at 7 p.m. Town Room, Amherst Town Hall, to solicit public comment on parking regulation changes and street directional traffic changes on State Street, Buffers Pond. The Select Board will be considering changes to parking regulations, including, but not limited to, the addition of parking restrictions, tow zones, and one-way traffic flow. Changes to be voted, one, addition of parking zone signage, two, addition of tow zones to no parking areas, Three, conversion of State Street from two-way traffic to one-way traffic for a distance of 2,400 feet, beginning 150 feet from Sand Hill Road. Oh, it's a public okay. hearing. I'm, I'm just confused. I'm just confused. So, um, so that opens our hearing at 721. And so Mr. Mooring and Mr. Zomek are here to help guide us through we, some of the things. Yes. We might also mention that in our yellow folder we have a letter from the Conservation Commission, so Thank another for, hot off the press sort Thank of. Thank you for um, noting that. That we haven't had a chance to read yet. Right, so we'll take a moment to read that, so hold on just a second while I, we shuffle our papers a bit and.
or are we ready? Has everyone found their appropriate maps and documents? So I'll turn to you, Mr. Zomek, to take us through there are no slides for this. Uh, there are no additional slides for this okay, this great. evening. That's fine. Uh, that's perfectly I'll fine. be very brief. I think the board has all the information that Mr. Mooring and I discussed last time with you. Um, there should be three letters, uh, one from Chief Livingstone, one from Chief Nelson, and uh, just a recently received letter from the chair of the Conservation Commission, Brian E. Angus. I believe the letters from the two chiefs were sent out earlier to the, to the board last week. No, that one. didn't happen. The fire chief is not in here. Yeah. Not in here, and we didn't receive it in email. We got links to Neither. maps. That's all we got. Yeah, we we didn't get memos. Police chiefs. Do so you have one from the police chief? Yeah. Okay. I'll take your word for it. There's also a letter from the fire chief, which I apologize you oh. did not get. Somebody stick it in the copy machine. Assistant Chief Olmstead actually has the letter from Chief Nelson. Wonderful. So he's going to make some copies. Okay, great. The letter um, came in person. Both the chief and the assistant chief are here behind us tonight, and I'm sure if, if the board has questions, uh, they'd be happy to answer those. Um, Mr. Mooring um, and I conducted our second walk with residents on 1025. It was attended by about a dozen people. Uh, that was on the afternoon uh, last Thursday afternoon. Well attended. Uh, we had uh, a lively discussion out on State Street, walked the entire length from Sand Hill Road almost up to the train trestle. A very good exchange with um, those folks, uh, some of them whom live nearby on State Street, uh, at least two residents of State Street, and then uh, some other folks who are just interested in the proposal. Uh, by and large, I think Mr. Mooring and I would agree that uh, overall the comments were very positive. Um, there were questions about implementation, uh, there were questions about um, um, some of the, some of the uh, comments that you all had made about uh, potential uh, impacts to other streets. We talked about that. We talked about peak times during uh, May and June before the colleges get out when uh, the pond uh, on those warm days does receive you know hundreds of people visiting. But by and large, uh, I think uh, the, the one way one way proposal and the parking was well received. Good to hear. So are there? We good. hand those to Mr. Just, Steinberg. Could I? We'll shuffle the paper. Clerk. Thank you. Just add shuffle one thing. Um, Elizabeth Hammond, who Elizabeth Hammond, who was the chair of the Puffer's Pond 2020 group, uh, had intended to be here tonight. Unfortunately, she is under the weather. Uh, she did just moments ago send me an email. I'd be happy to read that to you later in the hearing if that would be appropriate. I'll turn it over to Mr. Mooring or one of the two chiefs. So Mr. Mooring, if you want to. There's not much more to add. It, you've seen the proposal. Everyone pretty much is in agreement. It's something that probably should be tried and try to make an improvement there. And then again, most of what we're doing is paint and some signage, which is easy to turn around. There's only one piece of this project, which is actually some hardscape at the very end towards the railroad bridge. So. If you have questions, that's probably the best time. So I'll, I'll ask one relative to that sort of turnaround spot um, on the eastern end of the of the project. Um, how much uh, construction and how long will that take for you? I mean, obviously it'll happen some sometime in the spring because it's a little late this fall to do that. Is is it a very fairly extensive project or fairly simple and how quickly do you think, once you decide to sort of implement that, will it take you to do that? It's not going to be that very difficult. It's, uh, we've actually kind of toyed around. If it doesn't freeze very hard, we might start working on it this, this year before it actually gets colder. So we, um, and then it's probably less than a day of paving that we have to pave. We'll let people read the. Yeah, actually. Mr. S Mr. Steinberg, sure. Yeah, I did actually have a question I thought about when I was looking at, I appreciated the uh, enclosures with the uh, packet that we received. 
and one of them, and I don't know how to identify it, um, it shows the section that is from Mill Street, mostly Mill Street, and then it has a little bit of the pat, um, road going up towards the pond, and um, I'll show, hold it up like that so little, that you can see what it is. Yeah. And that what I was thinking about when I was looking at it is that 300 days out of the year, it's not going to pose a problem at all. But um, for the for those peak days, I was wondering about people coming out of the driveway from the house at 112 State Street and taking a right turn and going against traffic flow that everybody else is going to begin to assume is one way. and. Um, whether there's any risk of misunderstanding that it's actually a two-way street and um, conflict and uh, potential danger problems just for that, even though it's a, it's a very short distance, uh, it, it, it would be confusing to the greater part of the public who will assume that the entire thing is one way. So that little piece will probably be a double yellow line at that point. So it'll be lined and striped as it was a two-way road. And then that'll end, the double yellow line will end right before their driveway. So it'll be, you won't be able to miss it. There won't be a, anything that's not there. And then, and then, then there's question two that flows from that, which is you have a double yellow line that looks like a two-way street. People who turn in there not... Uh, I guess it's not going to be a problem. There wouldn't be any turnaround problem because I'd be going that way. So, okay. Answer your question. Uh, answer that, that part. Other questions? Assuming there's no one from the public that wishes to speak. <laughs> Give them the opportunity. Would it be possible for me to just quickly, this is a brief email from Elizabeth Hammond. Please. Um, like so many people in Amherst and surrounding towns, I love the pond and the whole conservation area around it. While it may feel like Puffers is a town park, in fact, it is a conservation area and thus ecological goals are important. It is a gem, but it has suffered in recent years from a lack of investment and management. I appreciate that the town is getting ready to take action on it. I support the design recommendations put forward for the Puffers Pond area. It is in alignment with the Puffers Pond. It is in alignment with the Puffers Pond 2020 plan developed by a subcommittee of town members I chaired. The improvements to the parking situation on State Street indicated in the plan make sense and are long overdue. The one-way designation will keep traffic at appropriate levels. Having fewer cars on the side of the road right by the water will improve water quality. Encouraging people to park in designated areas as the plan does will also help manage e ecological impacts of extensive human use of the area. I believe this will benefit, be benefit to one of Amherst's best loved conservation areas. I hope that in coming years we can phase in bigger changes for parking near the pond and use some of that revenue for pond area maintenance, which is really an unmet need at this point in time. The town also needs to plan for dredging the pond if we want to continue over the years as it has. But the proposal before you tonight is a good first step. Elizabeth Hammond, 75 State Street. Thank you. And if you could make sure to share that with us so that we can put it into our electronic packet and uh, include it amongst the materials from tonight's meeting. Are there other questions or comments we need to make within the hearing? Yes. I don't know if it needs to be within the hearing, but we've never known where those lines are drawn, so why not talk now? Um, when the motion is made, I would like us to clarify that um, where it talks in the fourth line about as shown on a plan entitled State Street Proposed One Way, it's at least four pages long. So it's not just five. Um, so just to say a multi-page plan or something like that would be helpful because it's not just one piece of paper and we appreciate the detail on it so it's a multi-page plan and the other part I wonder if we might include in the motion reference to the memo from Mr. Zomek dated 
1025 because in some ways I think the just the verbal not verbal obviously the text descriptions here they talk about the culverts the areas of high activity I think are helpful to go with the actual motion and I wouldn't want us to lose sight of it I mean it's 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 specific and yet gives us a broad enough envelope to work within that I wouldn't want to add it to the motion all the words to the motion but I would just like to also reference the memo dated 1025 as well Mr. Chair yes we've had this sort of back and forth on a number of things I don't see the need to clutter the memo I mean, the motion with those facts I think our discussion in the minutes do that adequately I think adding these things to our motion we are a accepting a plan and, it, and sometimes the plan can be printed on one page or four we're accepting a plan dated blank date we don't really have to say multi-page one page but the plan could exist in one big sheet so this is for our convenience to see it generated that way but it's whatever the bot whatever that plan dated is for the puffers parking um, so I, I would resist adding extraneous things to the motion that refer to these other documents. I think the minutes and the list of documents for the meeting that go with the minutes are adequate, but that's just my more minimalist approach to motions. Depends on who makes the motion probably, but yes. My concern <laughs> has been that typically we are not particularly well disciplined about including that level of detail in the list of documents that were available, and we've only recently started doing minutes close to the time that we actually have the meeting. So it's been, it's a work in progress and I can appreciate that um, and would understand that all these things would be listed as long as they are listed saying things like October 25th memo, not just memo from Mr. Somek. So as long as we are putting that level of detail in the list of, <coughs> attached, in the list of documents that. used at the meeting, then I'm fine with that. It was just a way of circumventing any possible delays associated with that. Mr. Simon. So I do note um, in my role of clerk that the open meeting law does specify that minutes contain a list of all of the documents considered by the body that's acting at the time of uh, at, the mo at the meeting where the motion was made and passed. And they don't always, and that was I know, my point. and I think that that's, uh, <laughs> that's a matter of our Yes. discipline in minutes as opposed to our discipline in motion writing <laughs> yes please so and, and referring to the plan I, I know we have these different sheets because we asked for the more detailed engineering but it looks to me like this is the pros proposed plan dated October no, 22nd it's not. no that is not correct that is my point. No, that is simply a smaller version of what we had last time. This five-page document is the one that's referred to in the motion. Well, I'm asking the applicant what would be the plan of reference. It's not that one. The plan of reference is actually the five-page plan. The five-page? Yes. And how would you describe it? Five-page plan dated something? If I may, the title of the five-page plan is in the motion. Right. That State Street proposed one way, exactly. And, but not, not, a, not dated or is no, it's it dated. Is, but it's dated. really tiny. Okay. October 20th. Yeah. Those five pages it, it's are also dated. mentioned okay. in the motion. You print it out uh, 12 or 11 by 17, it's much better. <laughs> right, that's it's actually pretty good. It doesn't really matter how many pages. It's actually yes. pretty good. So Since that's why I was so referring the to the multi page because it, it was five it's pages. not necessary <laughs> as long as it's referenced so to this, how many pages so one of the other things just since we're wordsmithing here one of the things that um, we did in the motion was to to offer you know distances and feet to sort of articulate this because we don't have property boundaries that we're dealing with and that sort of thing um, I might suggest that we use the word approximately mm -hmm. That way that gives them a little latitude if it's not exactly 900 <laughs> feet or 930 feet so i think that might be a wise component because oh. we, we talked about some flexibility in the motion so <laughs> we'll put that in there um i guess the other thing i'd just like to ask is you know should are we ready to close the hearing so that we can actually take up the motion so if if there aren't other questions i would entertain a motion for for closing the public hearing if that's if we're so ready I move to close the public hearing. Is there a second? Second. All right. We've got a motion and a second. 
So you have the approximates in here. <laughs> We might be able to put one single one that covers them all. Um, is, is there further discussion by closing the hearing? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 And so the hearing is now closed at 737. And so has anyone sufficiently crafted a motion? I don't think there have been any changes other than the idea of all distances being approximate. Or would someone like to offer the motion? I move to approve the following new traffic flow change and parking regulations for State Street from Sand Hill Road to the Railroad Trestle, all distances approximate and measured from the intersection of State Street and Sand Hill Road as follows, and as shown on a plan entitled State Street Proposed One Way by Town of Amherst Department of Public Works dated October 25th, 2018. North side of State Street, no parking tow zone from Sand Hill Road for a distance of approximately 900 feet. Handicapped parking tow zone from, just throw approximately in there every place, from approximately 900 feet to 930 feet. Emergency vehicle parking from approximately 930 feet to 940 feet. Drop off area from approximately 940 feet to 960 feet. No parking tow zone from 960 feet to 1,190, approximately 1,190 feet. Parking from approximately 1,190 feet to 2,000, approximately 2,330 feet. And south side of State Street, no parking tow zone from Sand Hill Road for a distance of approximately 120 feet. Parking from approximately 120 feet to approximately 830 feet and no parking tow zone from approximately 830 feet to approximately 2,330 feet. Second. So a motion is second. Is there further discussion? Hearing a yes, please. Uh, well, it's more of a comment. I mean, I support the one way, and I think it's, you know, time to do this. And there's compelling um, safety concerns. But uh, um, I think both the email that was read to us by Ms. Hammond and the one from, um, I think, Chief Nelson talked about, um, and for myself, to bring some attention to the need for additional staffing and maintenance to this area. So you can quibble about whether it's a conservation area or a park. It's a, it's a major recreation area, and conservation areas often do double duty as public space in all kinds of ways. But, um, you know, just kind of, you know, sending a, you know, one of those little uh, virtual uh, missives to the future board. I think attention in next year's budget to making sure that um, really looking at staffing levels for this area and maintenance. Um, I won't go into my own, you know, my own experience there last summer, but I, I think it's really time f to put some attention there in terms of our resources because it's used a lot and. It, would serve the residents well to have that kind of attention. So I know resource, resources are always tight, but I really think this deserves another look when we do the budget. Thank you. Mr. Steinberg. Yeah, so um, I didn't uh, ask uh, Chief Livingstone to step forward during the public hearing, but um, I did want to just sort of note that for good reason, we are making changes um, for both public safety and um, preservation of a tremendous asset of the town, conservation asset, by doing this um, change in traffic flow and parking. It is going to substantially reduce the parking and um, on those busiest days of the summer, uh, particularly <coughs> this um, first spring as it takes forward and while the university is still in session and we get those extraordinarily warm days that sometimes you get during late April and early May. I do have a little bit of a concern that we're putting a lot of stress on um, our uh, police department because there could be a lot of unhappy people going to the pond with the vision of prior years and thinking that, oh, I'm not going to have any problem finding a parking space and I'm going to go out and lie on the beach and do whatever I do, whether it's legal or not, like drinking beer or not. 
but um, it is going to have that potential. And um, I, so I guess my, my one uh, little bit of concern was is that uh, there could be some points of extreme tension which will require added um, attention from our police department. Did you want to offer any comment relative to that, Mr. <laughs> so probably true in the initial, you know, once, whenever we, or if this gets approved and, we, and it goes into effect and the DBW does their thing, when everything is completed, there is obviously going to be an educational component and then some enforcement. Um, the good part about the days when we expect the highest potential students to be, you know, if it's a really warm day in May before the students leave the area, we typically have additional police officers hired anyways because North Amherst being North Amherst. So, you know, it wouldn't be too difficult to have some of those officers be in that Puffers Pond area anyways, which we've been doing for a couple of years now because it has become such a popular student hangout with specific warm days in May. Um, and quite frankly, sometimes in the summer too, if students tend to hang around a little bit more. So yeah, there's definitely going to be an um, additional, uh, we're gonna need to have additional officers in that area, either as part of their regular patrol or we're gonna have Officer um, Laramie as part of his community outreach be up there. Um, I volunteered Eric Beal too, he doesn't know that until probably <laughs> right now. But um, you know, Officer Casey Nagel who's assigned to downtown when it's a little bit quieter in the summer downtown will also be able to go up there on his bike and stuff. And I've also reached out to the um, EOPS people, our Executive Office of Public Safety, where we get a lot of our traffic enforcement grants to see if it would be legal to actually send officers up there on state-funded grants to do enforcement in there. We can stretch the rules. They're okay with us stretching the rules on that. So as it pertains to additional staffing, at least from either the parking enforcement people or the police department, we'll be able to accomplish what we we'll need to accomplish with the current manpower that we have now. I agree, I think whoever made the last statement that down the road um, it probably would be a great idea to have seasonal employees up there. That would be kind of the eyes and ears for the police so that, you know, by the time we get up there, it isn't just, you know, mm -hmm. 300 people on the beach with open containers and stuff. So that would probably be a great idea. Thank you. Is there further comment? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? So that's unanimous with one member absent. Thank you all for coming and sharing that with us. So next on our agenda is our action discussion items. We're gonna head into um, that section of our agenda, which is the change of lighting for Fearing Street neighborhood, Phillips Street, and Allen Street. So I believe we're asking Mr. Zomek. No, oh, it's going to be the chief. No, oh, Chief Livingstone and, and Mr. Beal. Mr. Beal. Have and a piece of paper on. <coughs> we did get a new, with a fancier marking yes. of the poles. Right. That's. I've got a really clear copy here. If you guys, there's. I probably. Uh, I might have given you the wrong one. That's okay. We we got one that Ms. Beal, Ms. Mills numbers. did. Yes. Does it? Yes. Yes, yeah. yeah. Big stars on it or something like that. That's right. That's that. Right. This part, I'm finding old and new. Mr. Slaughter? Yes. I know you're digging up all these pap wonderful papers that we have, a number of which we had in our packet. There's a note here that looks like it's copied out of a book that I have no understanding of the provenance. Do you know what that represents? Yeah, so in my memo, I referenced that memo as being uh, the product of the police department. I think Mr. Laramie. Um, so that's why there's a cover memo that it's attached to that memo. Well. <laughs> by the time I looked at my packet, yeah, that wasn't they were necessarily separated. true. I'm sorry about that, yeah. Um, and it's, but that's what that's representing is, yeah. okay. Here's the one I'm looking for. That's the one. 
Let everybody continue to shuffle the papers for a moment. Oh my God. So you want to? Sure. So, thank you. Um, this was this is the kind of the next phase in town where our our um, septed people are. Crime prevention through environmental design. Um, this is the next area of concentration or concern that they've been um, studying and making recommendations for improvements. Um, you probably all remember that we came before you in the summer of 2017 to request some improvements, including lighting to Hobart Lane. Um, we've done some additional work up in the townhouse area. Um, through this, the SEPTED people as well. Um, and now we are at the Phillips and Allen and Nutting Avenue location. So these requests are kind of the final phase of what we've already accomplished in that neighborhood. Um, there was an awful lot, and I'll, and I'll read uh, Officer Laramie's little note on it, but the lighting requests are part of an overall strategy to de decrease disturbances, noise, other unruly behavior. That already includes community outreach and education, landlord engagement, university messaging and conduct, and other site changes, improvements and maintenance, community policing efforts and enforcement. All of these elements are already in place for Phillips, Nutting and Allen, and the lighting and improvement infrastructures are the final pieces. So um, it's kind of where we are with that specific location. Uh, um, you know, with our crime prevention through environmental design people, and certainly Eric Beal was part of that as well. I can tell you since the 2016 improvements that the board uh, um, voted on up on Hobart Lane, um, the most recent statistics on the quality of life calls is that those calls are down about 60%. So that's pretty significant. Um, overall, through all of town, our quality of life calls are down about 25% total. So um, this is just a small part of kind of what we're doing. And this was the next logical location to concentrate our efforts. So both Eric, Bill, Officer Laramie, myself have met with a number of residents there. They did a student survey. And for the most part, except for the residents on Nutting Avenue, everybody agrees that lighting, uh, we did some shrubbery trimming and tree trimming and stuff like that, but um, lighting's the final phase, so that's why we're here tonight. <coughs> so does the, uh, should we go to Mr. Mooring to sort of share his thoughts on this matter as well? Thoughts? <laughs> um, you have my memo. Um, I just pointed out there is, is a policy for this. The only thing I'm, I support the police in doing this and getting things squared away. I just don't want to kind of turn into people just ask for lights and get lights all over town, some type of rhyme or reason. The police have a very good rhyme and reason to doing this, and I support that. You have the price for it. Um, roughly it's twelve to $1,300, I believe is what I said for each, each light. There are some new poles that have to go in. They won't be, they won't need pole hearings because they'll be replacement poles and they just go in where the old poles are. So we're, we're in support and just wanna make sure it gets approved and we can move, move forward with this. Great, just a quick question about the poles that need to be replaced. Is that, um, were they due for replacement anyway and this is a convenient opportunity to actually execute those, those replacements or is it you know, something else about them that needs, you know, attention that requires the poles to be replaced? There's two things. One is Wemco is, or Eversource, sorry. Eversource is converting over to taller poles. You'll notice they're going much taller. Uh, they're about 10 more feet to each pole. Um, so the poles that need to be replaced are very old. They're much shorter. They look like they've been cut off or had an accident once or twice. So they've been sh shortened a bit. So I'm sure when we actually try to fit the light in, it won't, it won't fit in our space. We actually are allocated a space on the pole and that light isn't gonna fit, so they're gonna have to put a bigger pole in so we have appropriate space to keep our light away from everybody else. Okay. Everybody on the pole has a space, you gotta stay in your space. Right. Are there questions for Mr. Mooring? What's here? 
Yeah, I don't have a question particularly for Mr. Morgan, but I just wanted to make a general comment. Um, as one of the two members of the select board who's a member of the um, Campus and Community Coalition, uh, the whole SEPTED program really came out of um, present it, work that was done with the CCC and presentations that were made to that group. And um, uh, Officer Laramie being among the people who made very good presentations about what the history of the program is, what the goals are, and what the accomplishments are. And the first um, effort was, I think, Townhouse. And, um, you know, these have been um, proven strategies elsewhere, which is why it was then um, something the uh, police department at both the town and at the university were very interested in exploring. And it, it's from all of the reports that I have as a member of the CCC, the first two efforts have been successful, and that was the reports, I believe, that we have received at the community, Campus and Community Coalition. Ms. Um, well, Mr. Mooring, I'm glad you clarified that the, this um, request had a rhyme or reason to it, because in your memo to us, you say, in number one, um, the select board has policy concerning the placement of streetlights, which we've seen a number of times and was included in our packet as well. And then you go on to say, this area currently has more lighting than recommended by the policy, which is a little contradictory to what you just said, because my reading of the policy says that um, other locations deemed appropriate, as well as downtown streets and other streets with heavy pedestrian traffic, such as in the vicinity of schools and in commercial areas. So my, when I reread re this policy, um, I thought that this request fit perfectly within the policy. I, I understand it goes on. I mean, this policy was generated in 2001. Sort of, um, we don't want uh, residents to think that we're going to resume paying for streetlights that were eliminated in 1991, and I understand your fear of rampant requests for streetlights everywhere, but it would seem to me that this request fits squarely within our policy. I'm glad you said that. <laughs> Which part? <laughs> <laughs> that it fits within the policy. Ms. Brewer. Might I just helpfully, helpfully point out that until we got it in our packet two weeks ago, no current member of the select board even remembered this streetlights policy existed from 2001. That's so not true. We looked that's at it when we did the, um, Hobart. the Hobart. Hobart, Sorry, we right. did. So I, we, did we don't have it handy we regularly. We have seen it before. And so we saw it when we dealt with Hobart. You are correct. If you want quick access, it's on the DPW drive under streetlights for when people that call and ask helpful. for streetlights. Read the policy? Read you the send policy. them that. Sure. Excellent. Um, so if I could just add to what Mr. Steinberg said, I think we've seen real success. It's a real quality of life I issue. It's a public safety issue. And actually, I would want to go further in general, and I've, we've talked about this a couple times at the Municipal Strategy Subcommittee and at the CCC, I would love to see this kind of analysis done throughout the downtown because I think we have some other um, kind of what lighting deserts or <laughs> dark spots. There's some um, other safety, um, public safety things. UMass every fall does a, um, and I forget the name of it now, but Mr. Beal probably remembers where they do they walk through the campus. It's kind of like a take back the night kind of focus, like what's safe, um, you know. Where, where are there hazards and where might there be um, things that need either lighting or a safer um, in kind of environmental plan. And I, I think we're long overdue to look at the whole downtown in that regard. Do you remember the name of that? I I'm afraid I don't. I apologize. More work to be done. Yes. Did you want to offer sure, comments? I, I would just simply add, I'm, I'm, of course, Eric Beal, and one of the co-chairs of the Campus Community Coalition, along with Captain Jen Gunderson. Uh, as um, Mr. Steinberg and Ms. Kruger pointed out, um, this is uh, an effort that's been um, years uh, in the making, uh, and I'm very deeply grateful uh, for the, the partnership with, with the Amherst Police and, and the Chief, and um, really enjoyed uh, having the Amherst Select Board have representatives uh, on this coalition 
uh, with, with uh, Andy and Connie, and um, very, very grateful for their service. So thank you. I do note in that regard that uh, we have uh, notified the coalition that um, the November meeting is our last meeting as select board representatives. And if the town manager is going to uh, designate um, other representatives to be substitute for the role that we played, that's going to have to be his decision. Ms. Brewer. That's interesting since elected officials might potentially or it might be other people because I know obviously staff participate already. Yes. And so limiting it to staff may hopefully not be under consideration. Um, one of the things we've talked about before when we see proposals like this is cost, which is outlined here, the source of funds and the timeline, neither of which I see. So what's our, what's our theory associated with that? Mr. Morgan? So this is approved. It'll come out of the streetlight budget. So we have money in the operating funds for streetlights. We also have money in the capital for streetlights for replacements. They'll come from those funds. The timeline is up in the air because we do have to get Eversource to actually make the polls ready. As soon as it's as soon as it's approved, we'll uh, procure the arms and they go up first, and then we wait for Eversource to give us the the pigtails from the electrical line to hook to the light. Thank you. Yes, Ms. Brewer. So do we imagine, and I know obviously you can't control Eversource, and if you did, we'd be ever so happy, but um, <laughs> we've had that issue before. But um, in terms of do you expect this would be done prior to next spring? I actually expect it might be done by the end of the year. Excellent. Eversource has been really cooperative lately, and we've been able to uh, get things in and prioritize it and uh, work with them really well with that. So. Um, from that standpoint, Eversource is working really well. But if we put a request in, we get it taken care of like very quickly, usually. <clears throat> Are you on the motion? Questions? Yes, please. I move to approve the installation of five new street lights as follows. Poles three, five, and seven on Phillips Street, poles one and three on Allen Street. Is there a second? Second. The motion and a second, is there further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? And so that is unanimous with one member absent. Thank you all very much. Thank you. So next on our agenda is the South Amherst Common Traffic Study Update from Mr. Mooring. You'll take us through where we are because things have happened in that end of town that have complicated the circumstances. So if you want to. So we, we've placed the uh, traffic study on hold because of the station road bridge closure. There's actually a substantial amount of traffic that comes in station road into the common. With the bridge closed, um, doing a count right now will skew the numbers. So we made the recommendations. The Transportation Advisory Committee actually thought about it, molded it over, and actually concurred that yes, we should probably put off the counting until the bridge is open again. They did make one recommendation that we put a stop sign at the cut through across the common and that that stop sign be installed, um, whether it be called a temporary stop sign or just to install a stop sign at the cut through across the common, which is comes out on Southeast Street between the library and one of the residences, which I had the number in my head and I forgot but that's all that they thought would happen. We should be recommended to accommodate and maybe help the situation <coughs> if we mull over what's going on. It's in the, it's in your memo and actually it was a little, I apologize for the size of the. I think there's a memo. There's nothing in our packet. Okay, there was a what memo. <laughs> okay. We don't have anything in our so would the stop sign be on Two stop signs, one on each end, or are you talking about one stop sign, and if so, which end and why only one? Only one, one, only one stop sign on the east end of the cut through, not on the west and east end. The, more, the issue is more the people who are cutting across and making the left turn from that way. Um, people who actually are coming back and are heading back across, or heading south, excuse me, yeah. they don't actually use the cut through that often. 
if you're coming from a station road, you usually go all the way up station road and you make a uh, left instead of, it's kind of, should I give you a map real quick or? That would be a good plan. <laughs> if you can pull one up, that would be helpful. I think I know what we're talking about because we're talking about the longer cross through that is not the one that goes into Station Road, but the one that's farther to the south. Because people can actually make that maneuver that was being described at either of the cut throughs. So here we have the common, the south common. This is the cut through we're talking about. We're recommending putting a stop sign right here at this side. Um, so most of what happens is people who are coming down Shea Street, they cut across and shoot all the way across over to Southeast Street. And people who are on Middle Street who are coming north, they cut across here as well. People are really trying to avoid this intersection at the very north end of the common because it's hard to look back over your shoulder because of the way the skew is to see the traffic is coming. So when people are heading back to the south, if you're going down Middle Street, you've already made the split here because it's an easy, it's an easy just go to the right. And if you're going down Southeast Street, it's easy to go this way. Um, so there's not that much cut through in this area going towards Shea Street because you'd already have gone down the west side here and then you do this little cut through here. So we were recommending this right here, which is the one that gets the most, most bikers are going up and down this side of, and they're the ones who are having the problem with people not yielding to them. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Uh, so the other part of my question, I suppose, uh, because you were looking for the map, that problem doesn't exist at the one to the north that goes into Station Road because people cut there and then make the left turn there too for the same reason. People going to Station Road? Stop well, no, and there are um, people who come, who are going north on Middle Street, they have actually two options to cut off the one that you're talking about and then the one that goes into Station Road, and they can make left turns at either one. And I'm, I'm asking whether our traffic counts indicate there's no need for a stop sign there, too. There's already a stop there sign. One. There is one. Yes. Okay, thank you. Cool. Somebody who traverses this area on a multi many times a day um i didn't I've, I've heard people talk about adding stop signs but i thought we had a whole procedure and analysis before we threw in a stop sign someplace so i'm a little surprised that we're actually considering that tonight um i i know a couple of people have written emails with perceived problems i i don't see a real issue with the cut through the way it is now and with the Station Road bridge out, it's hard enough to navigate all of this, and I'm kind of not really thrilled about adding anything to any any of this. I think people do need to learn how to drive, and we need enforcement of good driving, but I don't see just, um, I don't really see the compelling need for the stop sign and what data that we usually ask for when we're gonna put in a stop sign, how, what we have to back that up, because Similarly to people wanting street lights, people always want stop signs, and we had this issue up at Henry Street, so what would make us want to do a stop sign now? The Transportation Advisory Committee were, was recommending that we put a temporary stop sign there, and they were basing it on the information they've gathered from <coughs> more discussion with the residents of the area. So the item on the agenda is not for a new stop sign. It's to update on the traffic study, and Mr. Mooring was updating you on everything that's been talked about for this area, um, including you know the status of the study, which makes sense to put on hold. And then as the Transportation Advisory Committee is discussing that, they had thought about this idea of a stop sign. But that's not, not a proposal not in front of you. Tonight. It could be at your next meeting um, during, during our normal process. Just as a question regarding that, would we have to, this would be a change to the public way, do we have to do a public hearing relative to that? I don't think we do, but. Not for stop signs, you've never sign. done a, 
You you could you I mean has there been a policy of the board to do a public hearing for a stop sign request? Our yield sign, um, and there's no formal requirement in the state rules that you do that like parking. Parking requires that you do uh, a hearing. Right. Okay. Yeah. Just wanted to clarify that for my own so, sake. So we else. might get a kind of we might get a formal request about that, but right now it's just an update. Right. Right. Did well, you, I, somebody, I, so you had a question. I believe, and I may be misinterpreting, but I believe that the TAC is requesting us to do a stop sign. So I'm not saying we do it tonight, but I'm not saying that they haven't done it because they haven't given us a memo yet. I'm saying that that could be done if we sound, um, are, are you looking as the second part of this, the first part was the update. Right. As the second part, I assume you might be looking for some direction as to whether or not we do want to deal with this we'll anytime open, soon. We'll, a, uh, the, well, because the TAC voted this, we will bring this back to you. Even, even if we said, even if some parties indicated they were not particularly interested, the TAC was in, is in fact going to write something up and ask us for it. They voted as then you already gave us yeah. the preliminary. Yeah, it's coming our way. So just to go back to the traffic study for a moment, would you suggest that it's likely we should wait until the the bridge at Station Road is back? functioning again, which would delay this by a considerable amount of time, or do you think there's some value to potentially doing some some counts even with the situation as it is now? I'm, I'm curious your thoughts about that and you know, I, sort of where we are and what you think might be advisable. I believe that the, the TAC is going to, Transportation Advisory Committee is going to want to look at more things. They've already, as they started to play with this, and actually I'll this is actually probably the second time. This is the second time since I've been in here. The Public Works Department has looked at this inter this common, and before that, it was looked at by the town engineer Jim Smith when he was here. Um, and what we've found out every time is, as we look at this, you start seeing there's more problems than just one problem here. Uh, the biggest problem Mrs. Kruger already came up with is that people just don't obey the rules and don't want to drive the speed limits and don't want to, they don't want to be, um, they don't want to do what they're supposed to do. So there's a large group of, there's a group of those people who are doing that. And then there's issues with site, there is issues with site. Um, the most biggest one is the north end. This is a very hard spot. I can, I can't even turn my neck to see, I mean, I'm, I'm, inching out and trying to see. Have yes, I, I've, I've had actually a, a whole group of people who uh, are in this area and drive through here a lot gave me their demonstration of how far they can turn their neck and said it doesn't even match. And um, <laughs> I apologize really to acute. them and, uh, and yes, uh, acute angle. <laughs> it's a very acute angle and as actually drivers get to a certain point of their driving career, yes, it gets worse. And I agree with that. Nicely put. <laughs> Um, for other drivers in their driving career who probably don't even look that direction, they just zip through and it's all set. Um, so, <laughs> and they're probably the ones causing the issue. Uh, so this little corner here really does need to be looked at. And what really comes down to it is how do you get rid of that? You've got to sacrifice something. Do you move the roads and get rid of one of these roads and put one down the middle? Um, do you get rid of one, one and keep this one? Do you get rid of this one and, or keep this one and get rid of that one? Those are, those are things you have to kind of think about is you got to change this little piece of the common. And then again, when you start talking about the common, you come to this area down here, which is, a uh, almost as bad and needs to be squared up as well a little bit and cleaned up a little bit. Um, this doesn't get as much of an issue, um, for some reason, now that the tree's gone, it's actually even less of an issue. But this needs to be cleaned up a bit too. Um, but you can't just put a road all the way through the center of Fiddler's Green. That would be uh, that would be uh, not acceptable, I believe, and we've been told that. So there is some other things that have to be looked at. These intersections here, um, people have talked about squaring these these up so that you don't have two. You just have one. And just have one here. There's been all sorts of discussions of making it simpler and making less points of conflict. So there might be more discussion as we go along, even though the bridge is closed. So just to, to follow on that idea, is is all of that sort of Fiddler's Green, sort of South Amherst Common, um, all part of the town way? It's all town-owned property. It's all.
public way. It's not set aside as a separate parcel as town common or town park. It's all a public way. Okay. So it gives us a little latitude to rearrange the roads in ways that are helpful, potentially. I mean, obviously, it's a green space that we're all common and familiar with and have emotional ties to or whatever. But um, from the standpoint of just sort of the strict sort of rules of what governs those areas, it, it is a public way. It is. Many public ways. <laughs> well, actually, to tell the truth, it's really just Southeast Street. And when you look at the way it was laid out, this is Southeast Street and this is Southeast Street. Right. Middle Street ends here. <clears throat> it's a boulevard at that point, right? Yeah, it's like a boulevard. The large green space in the middle. Shea like Street. And in Boston, right? Well, then, then the solution is to make each side one way. There you go. Just to add to what Mr. Mooring said, I and I think you already know this, but you talked about the other little intersection problem area with Pomeroy and Middle and South, which is also like, you're like, can I go now? There's, there's a lot of conflict there. So you're right, there's a, there's a myriad of problems. And changing something that's part of a historic pattern is like in a historic green, gets dicey. It does. I should be embarrassed to even say this, but I'm surprised you haven't suggested a dog bone roundabout there. Mr. Morning, right there. See those two little triangles? Wouldn't that be perfect? After a do study, he will come back with that. If you actually look Just at... Just move it around. If you actually look at the, the way we had it set up and one, one of our options the first time we looked at this um, back in 2004 or five, there are two roundabouts here um, with the possibility of third in the north. So it was... Uh, Kind of a roundabout Imagine. this end, a roundabout here, and a, or here, and one here. Mm -hmm. But they were too close together, so then yes. it kind of came down to being possibility of one roundabout and one roundabout. So yes, we've looked at roundabouts here as well. And it is the stop-start that's oh. so hard for people. Oh, and yes. Be before we let Mr. Morning know, I just want to note, and this is just an announcement, that we have a public meeting tomorrow night um, at the Fort River School, which is a different location than was originally advertised, and we sort of put that out to everybody as far as we can. Um, and we'll be talking about the Station Road Bridge. Uh, the chair has agreed to uh, MC the event, moderate the event, whatever, um, to help us uh, be able to get information out to people as, as comprehensively uh, as we can. So Mr. Zomak, uh, Mr. Mooring, and I will be at this meeting uh, at 6.30 on Tuesday, October 30th at Fort River School in the cafeteria. I was, I'm, gonna, I'm planning to attend, too, since my part of town, but if there's three of us, do we need to worry about posting ourselves? It's brutal. The select board's not going to get to deliberate on anything associated <laughs> with it, so it makes no difference. How, um, just, <laughs> but... But I did want to just ask, while we're on that topic, if it, which was such a perfect segue, is if you could just re, I know that none of this is simple, but I've been frustrated by some of the input we've been receiving that says, why haven't you gotten a temporary bridge, where I thought you made it extremely clear why we didn't get a temporary bridge, because we are not allowed to do so under the law. That in fact, we went off looking for one, thinking we'd be able to do it until the state said no. So that is still correct, right? Well, a temporary bridge is, is available, but we still have to go through the entire permitting process. And maybe Mr. Mooring, you can give a preview to tomorrow night. Well, the way I was gonna answer that is we're not allowed to do a temporary bridge the way we've done temporary bridges and other non-public roads or areas where the road is, or the bridge has not been as long as this. And we've done other temporary bridges on uh, watershed land and wells, roads out to the wells that we just basically vendors come to and we go to, and we've been able to do those rather quickly, but we, because of the process we have to follow, we can't do it as quickly as we would like to do it. I would also just suggest relative to the meeting for night is that at the original location, which was the community room of the police station that you post a sign, yep. pointing people to go down the hill and yes. go to Fort River School. And I would point out as a North Amherst person that um, we suffered Meadow Street. 
so now you don't feel bad for us. Well, no, but I understand the problem. <laughs> you understand? I understand the problem yeah. from both sides. So thank you very much, Mr. Mooring. Appreciate thank you your uh, thank you. information on the on where the traffic study is and some other topics about South Amherst Com Common. So you're always you. welcome. See you tomorrow night. <laughs> yes, we'll see you tomorrow night. So next on our agenda is the Downtown Recreation Working Group Fields and Facilities Preview Capital Plan Request. Mr. Zomek is going to take us through <coughs> some materials that were <coughs> shared with us um, at some meetings that the, the Rec Working Group had. Thank you very much. Um, I've asked Ms. Mills to uh, advance the slideshow, and I'll try to go through these quickly because I think the board is generally aware of this project. Uh, I, I've come before you with kind of a, a first look at this project, but I think we're well along now. And uh, when I get done the, the quick slide set here, I'd be happy to answer questions. Um, so as the board is, is aware, uh, the Re Downtown Recreation Working Group has been meeting for well over a year. Um, it has been focused on uh, the area that you see up on your screen and those folks watching at home see on the screen. And this is a great aerial view. Uh, for those of you who don't recognize it, this is the high school, what we consider community field. You can see War Memorial Pool right here, the track complex here, high school, the middle school. This is the, uh, the tennis courts over at the uh, middle school, Wildwood, and then the, the so-called Hawthorne property. So our overall focus area is really what we consider the core recreational facilities for the town, which encompass high school, middle school, Wildwood, and Hawthorne. And using funds from Community Preservation Act and uh, regional schools, we were able to hire this wonderful company, Weston and Sampson, to help us create a master plan for these fields. Next slide. Um, it's, it's a PDF, so it's going to be a, a little bit slow here as we, uh, we, we change the slides. So this just outlines our process. As I said, we've been working for well over a year. We've had a number of public meetings. We've engaged uh, uh, a number of sports teams, leagues, uh, students, and, and uh, athletes have come to our various meetings. We've gone through a number of iterations. Uh, I'll show you later in the, in the slide set here. Uh, that we have a couple of uh, plans and there is of course a preferred plan. Next slide. <clears throat> As I said, the core sites are really the high school, middle school, Wildwood, Community Field, and Hawthorne, but we did have Weston and Sampson look at all the fields in town from Mill River to Kiwanis Park to uh, Groff Park, but the core set is really right in our downtown we feel and the, the conclusion of Weston and Samson and the rec working group is that if we can make changes, positive changes to the condition and the efficiency and use of our core fields, uh, we can make a, a many fold uh, increase in the usage, availability and efficiency of, of how those fields are used for both middle school sports, high school sports and community sports. And as you, you all know, these fields are all, all also used by the three hill towns as well in the regional school uh, system, but also on an informal basis when people come from Leverett, Pelham, and Shutesbury just to uh, passively recreate or throw a Frisbee or throw a football or use the track. Next slide. As I said, this is just a, an um, an overview of the core properties. I wanna make a really clear distinction here because the Rec Working Group, um, this was news to some folks and I think it's new to some people out there in the public. What we're looking at here is the high school complex and what people need to recognize is that in the yellowish orange, that color there is community field. That is a town asset. In purple, we have regional assets. And of course, many people because uh, varsity football and varsity baseball and varsity softball are played on what we call community field. People often have a misunderstanding that that's actually regional school land. So our group was very careful to look at uses on the town property as well as the region. For many, many years, we have shared the use of this space, and that's one of the outcomes that um, we'll talk about in a few minutes. But as we look at a report coming from Weston and Sampson in December, 
Uh, they will make recommendations on how we can uh, better care for these fields and better share those fields. And um, uh, we'll also look at some of the costs of sharing and, and maintaining those fields over time. Next slide. So I'm really gonna talk tonight because we wanna talk about uh, costs and we wanna talk about phasing. And really what the group working with us and in Samson determined is that if we really wanna make change and we wanna achieve efficiencies and we wanna look at some of the most urgent needs, they are really at the high school and community field. So although <coughs> the middle school and Wildwood are part of our study, they will be included in the report that we get from Weston and Sampson. The main focus here is on the high school and community field. Next slide. So needs, there's a lot of needs out there. Weston and Sampson and our group went out on multiple site visits. We photo documented, we met with Alan Snow from DPW, we, we met with staff from the high school, including Rich Farrow. We talked with coaches, and what became clear, both at Community Field and at the high school, is that we have many, many unmet needs. Uh, years of, of um, I guess I would call it neglect and lack of um, um, investment in these resources have resulted in fields and facilities that are in, I would say, fair to poor condition. And one of the emphasis points of tonight's presentation is really the track and the field that is in, uh, uh, in the middle of the track. And that field is primarily used for varsity soccer. Um, this fall, the soccer field was actually closed by the athletic director because it was in such poor shape and there were great concerns about uh, safety. The track, as most of you know, has been on the capital list for a number of years and is in poor condition and may need to be closed as early as next year and we may need to look at holding our track meets uh, elsewhere at other facilities, either at the institutions of higher ed or at um, away meets. Next slide. So suffice it to say, Weston and Sampson documented all the needs. They, they uh, created charts, graphs, uh, we, we create, uh, collected data from LSSC, from the schools on usage. So the report is the first comprehensive report that I'm aware of that will look at our core facilities and also be able to tell us how many hours are, are being played on each one of the fields in the core of our recreational uh, resources, which I think is very exciting to know how many varsity sports, how many JV sports, and how many um, community uh, um, sports teams use these fields. A main ax uh, focus point is obviously safety was number one, and the second piece was access. All of our fields in this core area have been identified as having great unmet needs for accessibility. When you think about how do people get to the soccer field, how do people traverse hills like this, how do people get from parking lots downstairs to get to an ultimate game out back uh, of the high school? And for the most part, all of our fields do not meet ADA standards. Next slide. Again, great photo representation. Uh, the field, uh, the varsity baseball field, there is no way to get to the bar varsity baseball field um, from an ADA standpoint. We have great drainage issues behind the field. Uh, even the stands, uh, we talk to a lot of uh, people who uh, have children in the sports uh, 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 leagues and, and in varsity sports, and we, we are even lacking in our um, uh, areas for people to sit and areas for people to observe games. Next slide. Again, on the community field side, we know that we need to upgrade the area around um, War Memorial Pool. We invested many hundreds of thousands of dollars some years ago fixing the pool, but we did not fix the bathhouse, and we know the, um, the um, uh, <coughs> playground there needs quite a bit of work, and, and that will be addressed in this plan. Next. So again, let's keep going. Next slide. So I'm gonna go through these very quickly because really what we wanna do is get to the preferred option. But 
let's just say this, uh, through a, a very uh, deliberative and very thorough process, Weston and Sampson presented a number of different options to the group. Um, I would say the most significant, uh, in option one, uh, the most significant change is actually creating a track and field uh, uh, layout that is right to the west of the high school and having a multi-purpose field in the middle of the track. Um, um, and, I, and I think um, the, the main point here is that the track and, and the, the current soccer field is actually east-west, which is the incorrect layout and placement of that kind of facility. So in option one, the main change here is that we go to a north-south option with a six or eight lane track. So we immediately address the issue of a failing track and we create a, a, a multi-purpose field that can be used by every varsity field sport with the exception of baseball, which requires a 90 foot diamond. But even in the spring, the athletes in the baseball program, softball program could use that field for working out, et cetera. Next slide. Option two is slightly different. Um, and again, a lot of things pivot off the track because that the track and the field in the middle are the major investment here. And so what this option does is it moves the track farther west. We, we, uh, we consider this. There are certainly some issues relative to uh, how close it gets to the neighboring uh, houses. We also uh, added in option two a very um, um, thorough look at the area around War Memorial Pool. We added a, a, a playground, a small spray park. Um, we also added some, all throughout the, the plans, you will see this tan walkway system, and that is a multi-purpose path that be, can be used for running, for jogging, for exercising, and it really connects the whole area. You'll also see that uh, this plan makes the baseball field, the, um, the girls softball field, completely ADA accessible. Next slide. And then finally, in option three, this is uh, a little bit more radical uh, of the plans and actually ultimately was, was not recommended by the group. Uh, what this does is eliminate the entire 90-foot diamond where it currently sits and creates a track and multi-purpose field and takes all of the available space on what's called the upper tier here of community field and moves the 90-foot diamond over to the western portion <coughs> of the regional land. So we looked at all of these plans and we, next slide, we came back to the elements of basically plan number one. And the core of that plan, as I said, was to site the track and a multi-purpose field just to the west of the high school. And then uh, we, we costed out a phased one scenario where we would create this this facility and then grade and create drainage and set the stage for another phase of work to the west and to the north of the high school. So in phase one, we, well, let me back up. We believe that all of the phases of this plan uh, will probably take 10 to 12 years. The purpose of this report is to really inform upcoming capital planning uh, for the schools, for the regional schools, and also for the town. So in our preferred master plan, the potential phase one is what you see before you. This immediately addresses issues of safety with the track. It creates a multi-purpose field for all sports to use many months of the year. We're very limited now by the drainage and the fact that, um, for instance, the, the varsity soccer field, uh, the AD Rich Farrow reported that uh, there are times that the, the varsity soccer field is either so wet or so dry that the varsity soccer team can't even use it. So they're left playing away games or to go to other facilities. So phase one would be what you see before you. Next slide. And so what we asked Weston and Sampson to do, now granted this plan, uh, this slideshow that I'm, I'm, I'm taking some slides from is about a month old now. We asked Weston and Sampson to come up with kind of a high and low of a potential cost for phase one. And what they came up with is before you on the screen, a low 
of roughly 3.9 million to a high of 6.2. There are many elements to this, the size of the track, uh, the, the number of amenities that you include, um, all of the ADA improvements, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> what we've asked them to do since this slide deck was created and this presentation was given at a public meeting, we've asked them to hone in on these numbers. We've also asked them down in the lower right here to give us a hard number for what it would cost to simply recreate the track and a multi-purpose field, natural turf, where the track is today in the, uh, the, the uh, uh, substandard orientation of east-west. Their initial cost was estimated at 2.5 million just to do that. So here we are today. I've made a presentation to the regional school committee uh, a couple of weeks ago. This was well received. I made a presentation to the capital uh, planning subcommittee of the, of the region, um, and we've talked with Sean Mangano. We're beginning to really um, hone in on these numbers to see how these might plug into the capital plan. Um, so again, phase one, we all believe, should be track, multi-purpose field to serve multiple sports, both girls and boys sports, there is no determination that has been made on whether this is a natural turf field or an artificial turf field. However, there has been discussions in the group. I, I think it's fair to say that the group favors looking very strongly at an artificial turf field. Um, there are many benefits, including efficiency, playability, length of the playing season, and the list goes on and on. But we're well aware of some of the um, health-related issues that have arisen uh, and have been raised across the country, but I think the, the group is moving toward a strong recommendation uh, in that direction. I believe that's the end of the slide deck, so I'm happy to take questions. That was a very quick look at over a year's worth of work, um, and again, we are asking Weston and Sampson to also outline the other phases, and I said we're talking four to five phases over 10, perhaps 15 years we believe this is the highest priority. So does the board have questions or comments? Mr. Stein. Yeah, I'm gonna go with a comment as opposed to a question. Um, uh, early on in the presentation, Mr. Zomek mentioned the need to build this discussion into the capital planning process. I actually think that's absolutely right. Um, it's almost more of our issue than it is the regional school committee's issue because in the end, uh, capital expenditures by the regional schools get presented back to the town and it is divided up according to the regional agreement proportionate to the EQV in each town. And we know that therefore we're talking about probably close to 90% being from Amherst, so that if this were to go forward as proposed, um, there would be significant um, capital expenditures even on phase one when we have four major projects already identified as our top priority projects and we have other entities including the senior center that have been um, putting placeholders in. Um, so I think that it's important as going forward that um, there be some understanding about that and that we come to grips with what is our um, policy on it. And I have to go back to the regional agreement to, see, to re recall exactly what the mechanics are of the um, presentation because when a uh, capital expenditure is proposed by the region, then we have a period of time that we've usually just waived and allowed it to go forward. Um, I think that it was uh, that the select board under the current um, uh, refers to the, um, can make a determination to refer to town meeting. Uh, if, but it may be, incorrect, I haven't looked at it for a while, 
Uh, but whatever it is, we need to make sure we understand how this works with our new charter. Um, that's an excellent point, and um, not both points on how the town reacts to a proposal from the region, but also how this fits into the larger capital scenario for major capital projects. One of the things that has been discussed at some of these meetings is whether CPA funds could be used um, by all four communities to address some of these things. You cannot use it for an artificial turf field, but you can use it for other recreational facilities. And so there's some legal opinions about that. It's something that we would have to get our town attorney to weigh in on to be clear. And each of the four towns would have to have their attorneys weigh in on whether CPA funds could be used for the, as a source to address these recreational needs or not. Uh, there's an additional piece, and I'll pose it, but not looking for an answer today, of course, and that is that um, the, if the mechanism is that it is a proposal from the regional schools, and because it's a four-town proposal, therefore it's a regional proposal, and then it comes back to the towns with the mechanism in the regional agreement, can towns use CPA funds to pay a part of their obligation for capital under um, the regional school agreement? And I think that that requires some research. Right. Ms. Brewer. I have several questions. One is I appreciate that you gave us a curated version of the slideshow. We don't have all of them in our packet. And so it, there might have occasionally been a point where I was like, where's mine with the purple and green and orange section? Because <laughs> that wasn't in our packet. So you may have intended us to get it, but we didn't get it. And I'm betting you're going to tell me it's available on the website. Uh, I believe you, in the, in the electronic version, you have more slides than I even showed. Ah, excellent. 30-some-odd slide deck. So, and is that deck available, where is that deck available that we can point people at? Because I know you've been doing a great job with getting people engaged in your meetings, it's, et cetera, it's but where do we point people to? as well as on the Rec Working Group site. It's on the site. Rec Working Group yeah. site. Thank you. That's what this I wanted to be sure of. entire presentation is in both locations. Terrific. And then, since you probably answered this 50 or 100 times already, um, two of the labels that you have here, one is Shade Shelter Support Buildings and shows three little, three cute little Monopoly type buildings <laughs> over here on the side. What are, what does that mean? Um, I don't have that right in front of me, but, but no, I think I can, we need to, yeah, we need to, um, there we go. We need to account for um, any areas both for people to observe sporting events in the shade, but also we need to make sure that uh, the region and DPW have places for storage for equipment. So we're looking at different options for how that could take place on the site. You will notice if you look closely at um, well, this plan that is right in front of you, now phase one would not do anything on the town land, it would only be on region land, but you'll notice that the DPW parks and, and uh, trees and parks um, uh, headquarters, if you will, which is uh, right under where it says basketball courts, mm -hmm. we have, we have uh, in this plan, removed that building and right. moved it elsewhere. It assumes that they will move <coughs> somewhere to a central location and we've repurposed that site. But in any event, we need to have uh, equipment, mowers, et cetera, to maintain what is happening out there. We also need to provide bleachers on one side or the other, and then shade structures and whatnot for people <coughs> watching the events, track and field for teams, et cetera. One thing I will add just to that, to point out in general regarding all of these uh, various options that are laid out in the longer and that <clears throat> very much on the conceptual side, um, so the kinds of, you know, so they indicate the kinds of things that would go in these places, uh, but they're not, you know, specific designs by any stretch. So that's why they say shade shelter slash support, because it could be either or, or mm -hmm. both. And so, and there's a few places you'll see things like that, or even, you know, where the paths specifically go, or the particular, you know, like in the fitness circuit and that sort of thing, the sort of layout is, you know, an idea of what could possibly be there that's not a detailed design by any stretch, but I just want to point that distinction out for the folks. Thank you. And then um, something that I know got a, a moment's press when 
we knew it was fine. But sometimes people think of the pool as war memorial, right? And so when you say you're relocating the war memorial, you're relocating the space that most people in town have never actually looked at in terms of the ceremonies that we hold there. But so you're just talking about basically shifting that space so the flagpole, there would be a gathering area that that's the actual war memorial part. There's not statuary there, for those of you who haven't been there. Um, but but that's what you mean. You've never intended, It's. I mean, the pool house needs to be renovated. The pool's already been renovated. But it's just that little pocket that would get shifted. Yes, we need a new pool house. We're not going to renovate yeah. that one. Um, but yes, in, in one of the plans, it actually shows, yes, relocated war memorial. And it's really more a, a, a much... Um, uh, much more well designed. It really celebrates, um, you know, those people who have served in in our armed forces, and it would be located on or just off of Mattoon Street. Uh, as you all know, there's a flagpole and a very small uh, stone there now. It's very hard to gather there. There's just um, it's not ADA. All of that would be accomplished in this new plan. Kruger. Um, well, thank you for you know bringing this to us. We've we have been following it both as a board and as individuals at different meetings we've gone to, and um, it's really exciting to see the possibility of making this kind of improvement. I mean, and having it in phases, I think, is probably necessary. It'd be nice to do all of it. Um, so. I'm also looking at the capital planning aspect, which is going to go beyond the tenor of tenure of this board, but um, how to plan for it. So we know we have, as Mr. Steinberg alluded to, and we're all very aware um, that we have sort of the stacking up of major capital projects. On the other hand, none of those have enough movement to go forward right now. And, um, you know, if, the longer we wait on this, the closer we're going to get to the high instead of the low, I would just guess. Um, so I'm wondering how to how to keep this moving so that we have a chance of fitting this in among some really big one big expenditures. And um, often out in the community, people are like, "Well, I don't want to spend any money until we get a new school." So to not have to, you know, we we could probably do this with our. With that service capacity we have now, but there's the politics of balancing what we do first, second, and third, but it would be really nice to keep the momentum to get phase one done, and hopefully then people get enthusiastic about following with the other ones, because it just, um, from the few sessions I sat in on what we have now is unsafe and unworkable and kind of good comparison, you know, 2.5 million to fix what we have now to just make it, you know, useful versus something between four and six million. Um, it's easy to talk about millions as if they were just like, you know, $10 bills or something, other people's money, but it just seems so critical to upgrade these facilities. And it is complicated because there's the regional agreement and the other towns have to buy in. But I guess I would just say I'm really excited about this plan and would like to see it keep going, keep going, so we get to the point where we can make a financial decision about it. So yeah, just in conclusion, I mean, um, just following up on that, um, I just want to commend the group, the rec working group, and, and all the town, the hours and, and meetings that they put into this. I mean, as a community, what more are we looking for? We often say we don't have enough information to make an informed decision. <laughs> I'm really excited that we are very close to that. By the time Weston and Sampson gets done their work in early December, we will have a plan with cost estimates, with design concepts, but we will be in a very good and very well-informed position to help the region, to help the town, to make all of us, um, uh, help us to make good decisions moving forward. So the timing, I think, is very, very good. I will say that the region will need to do something um, the track will not last. We can't fix it. We can't patch it. And the field in the middle is not, no longer safe. So I think our timing, um, be it unfortunate, is probably pretty good that we have the plan done. I think 
The other piece of this is that there has been talk both about CPA funding, but also about private fundraising. We have been doing some informal outreach to other communities, and I will say, um, humbly, we are well behind most other communities in Western Massachusetts in planning for our recreational facilities. When you talk to coaches, when you talk to Rich Fair RID, and you visit other recreational facilities in Northampton and Agawam and South AD, Hadley. you mean athletic, athletic director. Um, when you visit South Hadley, East Hampton, Agawam, Northampton, um, you will see that most of them did invest in these facilities, something similar to this, some years ago. So we have time, we'll have a plan, and I think it'll inform our future decisions. Ms. Brewer. I was going to see if somebody gave me a nice segue for this. Um, What's, has there been some discussion amongst your group, just because you have a bunch of different people with a lot of different interests um, around, yeah, the current philosophy on corporate sponsorship? Because we don't do that in Amherst as a general rule. We're very cautious, very, very, very cautious, especially in the schools. We had some associated with lighting many years ago um, over by the schools, and I know that that's the reason I bring it up is not because you didn't think of it, but because I know that some members of our community will ask us to be thinking about that. So I hope that you can figure out a good way, given all the different partners you've got talking to each other about, and again, looking to some of our neighboring communities as well. Not that I'm really excited about the idea of the Bank of America War Memorial or the, you know, et cetera, um, but at the same time, it, it's something that does happen some other places and so we've been really cautious about not hanging up banners for things absolutely everywhere etc but um, in our caution we perhaps don't want to overlook maybe somebody's come up with a good middle ground associated with that it has come up but very informally I think it's a, it's a very early conversation I do know that you know at Mill River the Emirates Baseball League was granted um, permission to have some modest banners out on the um, uh, mm -hmm. Mill River 1 and Mill River 2, the two fields up in North Amherst. Um, but I'm not aware that we've gone much further than that. So, but I think it, it could certainly be part of this. And as I said, private fundraising is being discussed and has been successful in other communities in partnership with town capital and CPA dollars. So the, the other thing I would add is actually um, the tennis courts at the middle school, which you saw in one of the photos, which have been redone, it's probably been three or four years ago, but you know, there's a fairly significant grant from the USTA, and really the only requirement they had was to paint the courts a particular color scheme. Um, so that was pretty, you know, a fairly low threshold for us to meet. Um, so I think there, there are a fair number of grants around the country in various, uh, you know, sport uh, associations, you know, lacrosse, football, uh, field hockey, uh, I don't know about ultimate, uh, but, you know, a fair number around the country, you know, that, that you know, longstanding um, uh, programming uh, that have some grant programs that are also a possibility now, whether or not they then require an appropriate, I think I saw one for USA Football, which is a, an organization uh, in some ways uh, partner with the, the National Football League that that had a, I think it was fifty thousand dollars, but you have to put their logo on the field. It was for like a field, um, but you have to put their logo on the field, and that might be a bit too far for us. Um, but I also think in the fundraising that you know there there could be potentially you know local businesses that would be willing to to have their banner more permanently you know put in place, and I think that would be more palatable <coughs> to people if you know there was the Atkins Farms you know whatever. I mean, I'm just picking a business to pick a business. It could be you know one of the banks. It could be Bank of America. Okay. Um, could be the black sheep. It could be, you know, pick a business in town. Uh, Porta, perhaps, since they're new to town, we'll leverage them right away. Um, but, you know, I think that there are some options there. I think we have to get creative. And, and I think there's what's going to be the tricky part of that, I think, in regard to trying to fundraise is how to, to do that actively and coordinate with, you know, the sort of things the town needs to do to do diligence around procurement and, you know, that sort of thing. So it's like the town's going to have to go out and borrow X number of dollars, and then how do you mesh that with, you know, a, a fundraising, you know, uh, component that that, uh, you know, a isn't organized at present, but if it does get organized, you know, how do you sort of make sure that there's a certain promise that they can keep? Um, I think those are some of the 
interesting and complicating things that we have to, to look at, but I think it's certainly a significant factor. And, but I think there'll be some, some folks that'll be interested in sort of reaching out and writing grants, uh, grant applications, trying to get some funding in much the way we did for the dog park. Good, cool, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. What's our timeline? I'm sorry? What's our timeline? I mean, you have this beautiful timeline and then the last one doesn't have a date. Final recommendations and master plan report. There's noticeably no date on the last part. <laughs> I would, What's your I think goal? Our goal is to have the report done by December 1st. Wow. Yeah. Wrapping it up in November. Yep, we're wrapping it up. And then that way it can go into, you know, into the capital plan, which has a 10-year yep, right. horizon. And that then sounds great. The new form of JCPC Excellent. will. Thank you. Struggle. Thank you, David. Thank you very much. All right. We took a brief. So next on our agenda, uh, budget policy guidelines for fiscal year 20. And so at our last meeting, I think it was our last meeting, uh -huh. mm -hmm. um, we discussed these a little bit, and your packet should be a sort of uh, yeah. edited version of fiscal 19. It's turned into fiscal 20, so I made a few edits based on our conversation. Hopefully I have um, captured our conversation appropriately. Uh, one thing I will point out on the, on the front page there where it says October, and it looks like the four is there, there's actually a cross out, but it happens to coincide with the bar at the bottom of the four there. So that has actually crossed out uh, on that. It does look a little odd. I looked at that on my own computer about <coughs> six times and I was like, oh, no, it's I just crossed it out. Right. It looks like it's just not taken care of, but it actually is. Um, but I'm, I'm hoping that if there are any edits or, or changes that people have that we can uh, take them into consideration now. Mr. Steinberg. So there, I did, um, first of all, thank you for capturing our last conversation so well, so I don't really have any comments on what we did. As I was rereading it, I thought about one additional thing, and that is on the second page under what is Roman numeral one, subsection G, uh, and of course it reads as it starts, thanks to town staff's good planning, fiscal discipline, and current, projected revenues, we have no need to consider a proposition two and a half override. Then the, um, in the third sentence, okay. here's what I thought about. Since then, important economies in providing for health care, reasonable contract renewals, efficiencies in operation, this is where I'm adding, uh, besides starting at the end, and regular new growth that allows new taxes in addition to the um, loud 2.5% increase in the levy limit. That is actually part of the things that have made us be able to avoid an override. Mm -hmm. Right. Absolutely. I think that's really important to put in the new growth. So I, can, I will read again what I have. Knock out the first where it says uh, you have a contract renewals comma efficiencies in operations comma and regular and I did it in parens new growth uh, not parens uh, quotation marks excuse me that allows new taxes in addition to the allowed two and a half percent increase in the levy limit. have all been an important part of keeping within the two and proposition two and a half requirements. And I can hand this over to uh, my copy and give it away if uh, that would be helpful to the manager. Thank you. I do think that's a critical uh, thank you for noting that because I think that's a, a pretty critical piece we've noticed in the last couple of years. I mean, matter, as a matter of fact, just to be, put a little finer point on it, I think I, I was certainly noticing that last year the new growth relative to some buildings that had come online as far as taxes essentially picked up the, the health insurance increases we were covering for, the, for that. Filled our gap. They basically were a wash. And so that new growth essentially kept us from having to uh, cut decidedly more from our budgets, no doubt. This, this crew. Um, I, 
totally support that addition. Um, what I was wondering, and the other, um, you know, new red text in H, um, I think that's important. I know it was based on the conversation last time um, about the four major capital projects um, needing um, grant support such as MSBA or uh, MBLC. I wonder if we would be willing to go as far as to be clear that we're talking about one elementary school. I know in the four boards meeting that came up in a kind of roundabout way about whether uh, we thought it would be wise to be talking about um, two, two new schools or one and how we would pay for those. This talks about how we would pay for them, but we it doesn't clarify a position, maybe premature, but I kind of inclined to also give a message that it's one, not two. Just putting that out for discussion. I hadn't thought of us being so bold as to do that, but this is a great recommendation to the way we see the, this is the lay of the land as it is right now. And while I know there are many different opinions out there in the world about this, I believe that we've made it clear as a board up until this point that we can't conceive of a financial plan that would enable us to adequately repair two separate elementary schools, not even counting Crocker in the situation. That, that's, how do they phrase that in the movies? Inconceivable. Um, so I realize it's not inconceivable to the entire public, but the entire public has perhaps not been looking at it as long as we have. So um, I see that it would be more of a political statement than perhaps has been assumed that this was before, but I think along the lines of including the new growth, which we have not made clear in the past, we've just known that it makes such a big difference. I tend to agree with you. So you want to go bold on this? I don't have wording made up, though. Yeah, it would, well, have to, it would depend on the phrasing. Tonight, so. Because again, it's the idea of, you know, we can't afford to execute without significant support from these things. Mm -hmm we can't afford, and it's along those lines. As opposed to saying it's a philosophy, it, it's literally there's it's no money. financial reality. Right. One school, not two. I hear what you're saying. I think Mr. Steinberg is yeah. thinking about how to craft that. You could just say an elementary school, the Jones Library, a South Fire Station, and a Public Works. <coughs> Or one. It could be Anne or one. I mean, this is this is our document. It doesn't make anyone do anything. Right. Uh, although if we just say sorry. <laughs> if we just say one, there will be people who assume we mean one than the other. <laughs> and then someday we'll do the second one. As opposed to it will only happen once. Um, a single new? because there are people who believe that it's okay to just go ahead and do one elementary school and someday we'll do the second one. And that's not been the belief it's not system what we've been, of this board. It's not the assumption we've been operating under. No. I'll just state that I'm, well, I have an opinion. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to keep it to myself because this poses one of those circumstances where yes. it yeah. runs into a bit of conflict for me. So I'm gonna to try to, yeah. Steer clear of this as far as wording is concerned, but. I almost wonder whether instead of working around the one and end, if we're really meaning what we're saying, whether that we should just come up with an entirely additional second sentence, additional sentence after the long-term capital projections and before the new underlined sections and saying, Financial analysis has, um, t I, this isn't exact, because I'm just making this up off the top of my head, financial analysis has determined that it is only feasible to build 
one elementary school building to replace the two existing structures or yeah. something like that. I mean, if you're going to be bold, you might as well be bold. I'm, I, I'm in favor of it because that's how we all feel and that's the premise we've acted on throughout the whole school discussion. We've taken positions right. on it, informed positions. Exactly. And I like the way it talk, you talk in the phrasing about being clear that we're not just talking about one school and then someday another school. One like school I keep replacing. referencing. It's one replacing two. Okay. So are you actually saying that ultimately you want to get to two elementary schools in town versus three? Correct. Rocker and one new. <clears throat> we cannot do a Wildwood project separate Fort River project that the town finances and the number of capital projects that we have make that financially unfeasible. That's, I think, our wisdom after having struggled with this problem for many years. So that's our guidance in, until proven <coughs> otherwise. So what I would suggest at this point, barring other changes to the document, I mean, we don't have a lot of meetings left, but we have more. I mean, we did this in December last year. So um, what I might suggest is that um, I take the edit that Mr. Steinberg suggested relative to the new growth, and um, I'll take the phrasing that he offered relative to the comments of, of the three of you relative to that uh, in the elementary school building and, and sort of fold those into this document, and we'll, we'll revisit it on the 13th. Is that okay or do we sure, want I to I think we can dismiss we can dispose of this item I think we've I'm, you know pretty well, happy I think the manager has the text it may just when you see it written out it may need a grammatical correction or something or a period or a comma but I would if, love to if the board is happy with item. that I'm I'm certainly fine with that as yeah. well and so we yeah. could we had could, it in our packet three four times recently right as, so as an can. FYI in our packet when it's done as opposed to we're going to revisit yeah. it again. is that okay with you Mr. Chair that we just uh, it's absolutely fine with me I'm, I'm happy to to, to, to handle this in either way. I, I didn't want to presume we could just edit it and, and you know, need a make the motion with, with amendments, out, but, but I'm happy to do. Um, so are you suggesting another sentence? Yes. Yeah, he yeah. knows okay. where it's before it, the red. It's before the red. Yep. Right. And I made notes as so to So it's what, in between. Be. And I'll, I'll, I, yep. I can, I made notes on that. I'll make those yep. correct. We can and, work on that. And, and share those with you. Yep. Um, so is there, are there other comments or suggestions? No, since everything else looks great. Everything else looks good. Yeah, I mean, it actually good. could come in at the end after, uh, because it, the way it reads, it is clear that the cost of four major projects coupled with the ongoing capital needs of the town, and then it talks about MSB and A and MBLC, and then say, in addition, mm -hmm. um, yeah. the financial, costs of constructing more than one elementary school um, are not an advisable plan for addressing the problems in the two existing buildings. I liked what you said better before. Yeah, I liked it better before. Yeah, yeah. it's uh, getting, you're trying to <laughs> yeah. make I, it I would, sound I good. would put it in the middle part and maybe have to, yeah. you know, but. Okay. Because if, you had it the if first I may, time. The, the, um, the part that we're trying to get across to belabor this completely is that we believe that there can only be one building that will meet the needs of both those two elementary schools right now, Wildwood and Fort River. We're not saying where it's going to be. From a financial. But from a financial point of view, it's going to substitute yeah. for both of them. And so it just has to be super clear to the reader that we're not saying do one and someday do another one. We're saying there is, on, there is only one. There's only enough money for one in an ideal world and some other universe. And we should probably, we should specify Fort River and Wildwood, I think, in words because those are the two that are clear. Under. Yep, and then we've done it. So, so you would say something like uh, one elementary school 
to replace Fort River and Wildwood? Something as simple as that. Yes. All financial indicators are or right, something. Right. The phrase, whatever Mr. Steinberg said Only financially earlier. feasible path. Only, only financially yeah, feasible. Only feasible. It is only feasible to build one elementary school building to replace the two right. existing, Fort River and Wildwood, or, or to replace uh, Fort River and Wildwood. Right, right. So you get financially well. feasible at the beginning, and you weren't going <coughs> to wordsmith, but you did, and it was helpful. Okay. <laughs> so I will, I will do that. But, and so we do have a motion, motion. on a motion sheet, if someone would want to offer that. The motion is to approve the FY20. I'm going to insert that in there. Mm -hmm. The FY20 budget policy guidelines dated October 29th, not for fiscal year 2020. The FY20 budget policy guidelines dated October 29th as amended. Is there a second? Second. We have a motion and a second. Is there further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 And that's unanimous with one member absent. Good work, everyone. Thank nice for that. job. So I will make those edits and we'll accept the changes, etc. Thank et you for all the work on that. It's just kind of really really never ending. It was, was not bad. Uh, and I apologize. I didn't proofread it until this afternoon, so I didn't think <laughs> of it until this afternoon. Be kind. Okay. It was two really, 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 anyway. yep. really good things. Thank you. So next on our uh, agenda is uh, charter transition and any updates? Um, I gave you a fairly detailed update last week. Um, mm -hmm. the, the bylaw review committee meets tomorrow and they're meeting with uh, former Senator Rosenberg. They're still open to meeting with members of the board if they're interested, if you are interested in meeting with them. Um, our sort of planning group is meeting tomorrow as well. Uh, we've had good success in securing um, the, the sort of some pluses in mind, uh, uh, some good success, but some disappointments in terms of who we're able to uh, engage in the in the um, event. Um, <clears throat> still working on some elements of it. For instance, the Am the Amherst Gospel Choir. Uh, it's a little bit too early for them because some are, some of their members are still in church. Um, <coughs> so we're trying to think if there's they can come later in the program and still be a part of it because we feel that that's a very important part of our community and want them to be involved. Um, as you can see in here, the room continues to take shape. The, the work um, right now is being done. It, most of the work is, tech, is uh, technology and um, electrical work. Uh, the finished carpentry will be done, um, I think, later this week. And again, I I'm really, really proud that the construction that you see and the finished carpentry will all be done by town employees who have um, offered to provide, to do the work because they really want to participate and be part of this, uh, creating what's going to be in this building. Um, as they continue to do the work, it makes this room more and more off limits because there's a lot of construction during the day, there's sanding and things like that. It creates more debris. Um, and uh, it becomes a challenge for us to find rooms, especially because we also have lost the first floor meeting room because of early voting. Um, so, uh, but this room will be, you know, not be, will be in shape uh, for the council's first official meeting on December 3rd, we hope. Um, so we're still driving towards that. Um, those are the major things since last week, and I'll keep updating you. Yeah. So uh, actually, this will return to the item that I raised previously, and I just wanted to um, see that some thought is given to it. I had made the comment about the campus and community coalition, and um, that it really is a matter for the town manager. And the reason I said that is that we're really venturing into new territory for the town because we, um, the elected body is labeled in the charter as the legislative body and the executive is um, labeled as the manager. And when we've been in our um, current format, because the select board was the executive, uh, 
first Ms. O'Keefe for many years and then followed by Ms. Kruger and myself after Ms. O'Keefe left the board um, have been members and that has been so that the executive, elected executive would be represented in that coalition in addition to the staff who are present at times. Um, the public health directors are sometimes um, assistant fire chief is frequently there and the deputy police chief is there virtually all the time um, as well as officer Laramie um, so you know the the executive is represented by staff but um, now um, a thought is going to have to be given not just on this particular matter but on a series of matters as to how you deal with the fact that the elected body will be expected to participate in some things and it's good to have elected people participating in some things but it is the legislative body not the executive body that is doing that and how that comes about and how that appointment is made is something that I think is going to be a um, matter that's going to require some consideration and not discussion by us. I was just going to say, I actually think you two ought to talk to the town manager about that and talk about, you know, as things have unfolded over the years. I and mean, before Ms. O'Keefe, there was actually another select board member who was involved in a very different variation of the CCC, but it was still technically called that, I think, is that to give him, you know, insight as to if you vote, what sorts of policies, you know, how it actually works, and then that will help him and you know choose better as to as to what he recommends our future representation looks like because you've now been involved for several years and I think that would be insightful for him when obviously he doesn't go to every single thing right yeah now. The, the the discussion of the CCC of course in the particulars we can do that too there is an overarching issue though about how we as a community are going to be dealing with this distinction between an elected legislative body and not having an elected, you know, when, when somebody from the elected legislative body participates in something that is really not a legislative function and how that appointment gets made, and I'm not gonna play it out here because there's too many permutations and combinations of it. It's a policy issue and I just don't know that it's our role to is a slug board to resolve that. Buckman was going to say something. On this well, point. I think the, this is coming up, and we'll, we'll have a number of these items, and especially with the chair um, not running for re-election, not for election. There are a couple of his s slots that he sits on, mm -hmm. and I think it was the PVTA. And it's mm -hmm. the PVTA and the MPO both. That and the MPO, I think, and one of them had to ch well, is changing their bylaws because it says it doesn't allow someone from the town to be represented because it says a, a member of the, from the select board. And so we, and there are a number of towns who have become council, have council forms of government, but don't have mayors. So they're changing it to allow for the, a council to be, a member of the council to be represented on the board. So I think we're running into this. And, and I think because we raised the issue, they noticed, oh, this applies to you know, other communities as well, that we never fixed it, so they're gonna fix it now. Right, in that particular case with the MPO, which is the Municipal Planning or Organization, <clears throat> the Pioneer Valley Municipal Planning Organization, it has a requirement, and this is, I think, by their sort of charter via the state, is that its elected officials have to serve on that board, and so that immediately, de facto, would lead toward the, the council, but it wasn't expressly in the MOU. Um, so we just altered that in our last meeting to to include that, but but um, you know again you know the the PVTA actually has a little more latitude as far as the um, appointment to the advisory board there, but it's a very important one. We have a significant vote when we go and and participate in that in that board. Um, you know our our representation on the MPO is part of I think it's five or six communities. I can't remember right off the top of my head. But we get one vote and it's equal to everybody else's essentially however at the uh, pvta it's it's weighted based on number of riders and we have a large number of riders so our percentage is quite high given our population so it's important for us to to be represented there and to participate actively in that in that particular organization but um 
most of the designees are, are folks from an executive branch. So just out of curiosity, I don't know if Ms. Brewer can answer this question, but she's the only one who's here who might even be able to, and that is when Mr. Musanti was in that position on the PVTA advisory board, which he then became chair of the advisory board, of course, during his tenure. Um, was that a decision of the select board or is that a decision of the town manager? It was a decision of the select board. We designated him to do it. Thank you. And so it was like the elected officials were doing it because we right. chose him. Right. Yes. Um, just to kind of follow up kind of comment because I've been thinking as I've gone to different meetings, attended things, uh, <coughs> been in some of my liaison roles, um, I'm very aware that a lot of what I do is representing the town as a member of the elected select board. And I've been trying to figure out which committees um, I need to actually tender a formal resignation from and which ones is just sort of, you know, informing or figuring out. But um, as I get near the end of my tenure, I'm very aware of, like, oh, this is the last meeting I'm going to of this and, le and letting people know. But um, I expect that on whatever December 1st, our last meeting, I would be tendering resignation letters for um, some of the things that are more, where I'm actually appointed, but I'm appointed to represent the select board or the town. So it's, I think we all have to kind of figure out some of that. Right, so another one for me is the uh, Amherst Municipal Affordable Housing Trust. I'm right, you're the, technically, a, you know, a yep. select board member is a representative on that. And I, I think that's one of those where the bylaw review committee's mm -hmm. probably yeah. got an obvious suggestion there, but there'll be an empty seat until it is right. filled yeah. by someone and from I've the council. Parking. Right. Right. Yes. To add to that list, and I'm sure it's really at the top of everyone's list, but UTAC. Uh -huh. We struggled a lot with how to define UTAC and came to the executive <coughs> that it has now, which very specifically included an elected, again, obviously the executive and legislative branch issues, but in terms of an elected body representative. A lot of transition is getting down to the nitty gritty. Mm -hmm. Are there other updates or topics for future council consideration we wanna make sure to make note of? If not, then uh, let's move to section seven of our, our agenda and, and as of our packet being delivered to us, our consent calendar did not contain an item, but it does have an update as of uh, the materials we received this evening. So there are, I believe, two items that were brought to our attention this evening for consent. I have a question. Yes. So in my yellow folder, and maybe it's just because I'm special, I haven't checked Mr. Walds to compare, <laughs> I see that I have the Esalon coffee roasting, and that's fantastic. But I'm trying to understand why I appear to have, but I'm sure there's a really good explanation for two different sheets of paper where the chart's the same. It's because the consent calendar that's on top has added the Esalon, mm -hmm. and I can toss the, set, the correct. other one that was in the yellow folder. That is correct. <laughs> We're updating our updates. So these that's came correct. in today, and Ms. Bills consulted with the chair to see if uh, some, uh, the, the, the dates on these were before your oh, next meeting. Right. So the chair said, that's what he was just saying, is that there's, that's the change that you're seeing tonight. So, but they're right. both in our yellow folder. That's they what are. I was confused by, rather than just one really? of them. They are, and they're both by the same. two uh, sheets like this. So they're back to, uh, yeah, and the actual application itself. Yes, that back I Back to back. They should have been in your, in, oh, your yellow folder. Right, right. But, so in the yellow folder. But we was, only need this one now that has the motions at the top for Esalon. We don't that, need the other chart that was in our yellow folder. That. And we also don't, no, I'm saying these both right. were in my yellow folder in addition to what I already had in my packet. Right. So what I can do is I can, one, take the one that was in my packet and dump it away. Yeah. I can also dump the one that doesn't have the consent calendar with Esalons. Correct, right. We are just continuously updating. Yep. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Mills, for like constantly kind of like trying to get time. everything. Right. <laughs> and then December 1st, we burn the yellow folders. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Continuous so speaking updates. of that consent calendar, um, again, those those two items were um, were for uh, dates that are uh, proceeding for events preceding our next meeting, uh, and so uh, 
believe all of the sort of usual appropriate things have been uh, taken care of and noticed relative to those. And so we do have two items on our consent calendar, which are for um, one day wine malt licenses, uh, one on November 7th uh, from 6 to 9 p.m. at Eric Carl, and one on November 9th from 5 p.m. to 9 p.m. at Converse Hall at Amherst College. Um, and so uh, yes. could be a single could, motion. Could, the only thing I didn't, I just don't want us to say the part about the additional page on the select board agenda because, like, in the motion, away. yeah, that didn't happen. But however, you want to alter it to cover those first two is fine with me. So, would someone like to offer a motion? Uh, yeah, I move to approve the consent calendar as presented in the presented online tonight. packet for the meeting. Uh, select board meeting of. No, it can't be the online packet. That's presented because that's what we're. Why don't you just say as presented? Yeah. Yeah. That's presented. <laughs> what's what's presented. Of, yeah. <laughs> just kind of drop it. That works. Hope that the right one gets. <laughs> okay, so we'll, let's do it again. I move to approve the consent calendar of October 29, 2018, as presented. Second. So we have a motion and a second. Is there further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 And that's unanimous with one member absent. And so we have um, also a number of uh, license renewals that um, of annual licenses. And so I would also. That one is the same one? Because if it's not exactly the same as the one that was. Oh, sure. It is identical. It is actually identical. The chart's identical. Was it literally, it was a cut and paste. <laughs> I mean, literal taped. <laughs> old. She old went old school. school. <laughs> old school. So old then school. we can just read it the same way. So then it, it still was an additional page of the agenda. It's the same as the original additional page of the agenda. So, so there's we're nothing good. new in this box. So I would entertain a motion. Which I'm sure is disappointing to everyone because you want to get more of them done. I move to approve the renewal of annual licenses for the calendar year 2019 as listed in the additional page of the select board agenda of 10 29 18. Second. So we have a motion and a second. Is there further discussion? Should we wait for Ms. Kruger? No, me too. Okay. Uh, hearing no other discussion, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 And so that's unanimous with two members absent. <clears throat> so I believe we're now to uh, the town manager's report. Mm -hmm. um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, last night, uh, the, as everybody knows, the uh, Boston Red Sox won the World Series. Uh, the police and fire departments were uh, had their full command staff on duty as well as additional <laughs> staff. Uh, relatively quiet night. There were some. There was a significant activity on the UMass campus. There was a small fire at Townhouse. Uh, the bars were full, but uh, uneventful, and um, are. Uh, pretty much, and uh, the, the university had opened up an emergency operations center. Uh, we were thankful that they won on the first try because we didn't want to have to bring all the staff back in on multiple nights because that's very expensive to do. Um, so everything went quite well, and uh, pretty much people were wrapped up by 1230 at night last night. So that was a really good news. Well prepared by the police and fire, of course, and good cooperation with the university and the U university police department. Police department. Uh, a piece of good news is we got notified today that we, uh, the legislature had passed additional funds for Chapter 90. So we will receive an additional $168,467, which puts our total Chapter 90 funds over a million dollars, which is really good news. We're going to need it, um, especially when we start looking at the bridge repairs that we need to do. Um, the, um, we received a letter uh, from our sister city in Kanagasaki 
and they have notified us that, that noting that it's the 25th anniversary of our relationship that they plan to visit uh, Amherst March 20th to 24th and I believe the mayor and some uh, some other dignitaries plan to attend so it's something that um, we need to start thinking about if that's really going to happen um, there was a public forum uh, on uh, October 24th in the Banks Community Center on the bike and pedestrian uh, um, plan that the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission staff were, was putting on. It was very well attended, really crowded, and um, a lot of activity, a lot of people engaged in the, um, the bicycling and pedestrian uh, planning that's going on. And lastly, I want to announce that um, we have a... Uh, uh, created a new job title for one of our staff, Brianna Sunrid. She will stay in the IT department, but will take on the new title of communications manager. And this is, will be, she does a lot of this work already. She will retain many of her duties in the IT department, but will take on a more formalized role of trying to be, have us be better at communicating with the public and to be listening to the public as well. Um, part of that uh, um, job will mean that she will be moved onto the mezzanine. We'll be moving some offices around, and um, I think that her addition to our staff, along with Ms. Mills and Ms. Moisson, will make a really strong um, cadre of people who are very engaged in the community and will um, provide the town with a, a much, many better ways to communicate back and forth with members of the community. So I'm happy, and congratulations to Ms. Sunrid for that. Uh, promotion basically and that's and that by the way was reviewed with the personnel board and approved by the personnel board as well so that's all I have for tonight Great. mr. Steinberg so uh, since you were uh, mentioning it I did receive a copy of the uh, email from <coughs> Kanagasaki and uh, mr. it was from mr. DeGrasse and what he said actually was is that we are also bringing the superintendent and the head of the library to celebrate the 25th anniversary of the sister city relationship. Um, and uh, he goes on from there. Uh, it really has always been a three-party relationship. There's been the schools through the student exchange. The library has been very actively involved in sending um, library materials back and forth. And I'm pleased to report having been to Kanagasaki, which is actually in section of the books that we've donated, a lot having to do with Emily Dickinson, and it's a very popular section. Uh, but uh, in any event, um, I think we um, probably want to reach out to the superintendent library yeah. director to Good let point. them know that. Excellent point. Are there other questions for the manager relative? If not, are there, are there MIP reports? Yes. yes, you're going to talk about Thursday night's housing forum. I am going to talk about that. Okay, good. And I'm going to mention that in the packet is the letter that the superintendent wrote and was previously emailed to us about Pioneer Valley Chinese Merge and Charter School. And yes, I'm still working on that with the chair of the school committee. And luckily, they extended the deadline. So we have a little more time past the election that I can work with Mr. Steinberg on that. And you were also going to tell us about, look at this, look at this. We got public hearing notices ahead of time. That's right. Some people get excited about the weirdest things. <laughs> you can't say the public, we didn't know. I hate being stopped in the garden by this person Everybody who reads a legal me. hearing. Thank you. And I don't know. So it's all good. So I will, oh, I will I, note those, but I will I, wait. I thought of one other thing. Are you, yes, I didn't please. mean to interrupt you. Are you, are are you going to talk about the MMA? <laughs> I was going to let you. <laughs> oh, so I'm not stealing your thunder? No. Oh, I'm just to let you, you know. Um, Ms. Brewer and I and Mr. Buckman went to the MMA legislative breakfast last Friday in Sunderland, but the day before that on Thursday we had a, um, a separate meeting with the staff from MMA who had come out um, for the Sunderland meeting and some other things, and they had asked Mr. Buckman to um, set up something with some of the with the elected officials. So Ms. Brewer and I, Mr. Buckman, and I know it was Lisa, Brittany, and Alondra. Alondra. 
Yes. But I don't remember all the last names, but I got the, those. And they, um, they were all um, new staff at MMA, and you can imagine that Ms. Brewer and I gave them quite the earful of our opinionated opinions. <laughs> that's um, what we did, yes. <laughs> that's but, what um, we did. you know, our, I guess that was our style of mentoring. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I luckily, like Mr. Bachman couldn't say, "Well, I'll never do that again," because oh. like, there's no time left to never let like us do it again. Mr. Bachman to crack up in one of our meetings here. Um, so I just wanted to let you know we did that, and we learned. Um, uh, Steve Kulik was honored in as part of the legislative That's breakfast good. meeting, which was really nice. And then there was discussion of current legislation, things proposals MMA is working on, you know, kind of feedback from members and everyone had, you know, favorites like charter schools and this sort of, you know, top ten list. But um, it's nice to see people from the other towns that I haven't seen for a while. So did you say all the the elects came? The these uh, <coughs> people who won the uh, preliminary um, the primary but aren't officially um, Sworn in, and were there and got to int got introduced, even though essentially they're not running against anyone. So the presumption, the, the presumptive uh, electeds, so and they didn't get any time to talk. So theoretically, they listened. So the <laughs> Which was so good. Uh, Mindy Dome, Joe Comerford, um, Lindsay Sabadosa, and um, Natalie Blay. And Natalie Blay. So it was really exciting to see the new faces of our delegation there and. Uh, Ms. Steve Kulik said some, you know, really nice things about how well, well we're going to be represented by that group of women elected. So it was pretty exciting. Other member reports? Mr. Steinberg, hmm. anything? So I'll I'll take this moment to read, <laughs> read about public hearing notices so that we are all per perfectly aware of what was closed. So the first is, in accordance with the provisions of Chapter 138, Section 12 of the Massachusetts General Laws, the Amherst Select Board will hold a public hearing on November 13, 2018, beginning at 7 p.m. in the Town Room of Town Hall, 4 Boltwood Avenue, Amherst, Mass., to act on the application for a new annual all-alcohol, all, eh, excuse me, all-alcohol on-premise liquor license for the trustees of Amherst College doing business as Schwimm's Pub, Keefe Student Center, 16 oh. Barrett Hill Drive, Amherst College, Amherst, Mass., Joseph Flukiker, Manager, the premises in consideration consists of 971 square feet and has four exits. That's the formal reading of that. And then the second one, public hearing notice, this advertisement constitutes notice in accordance with the provisions of Chapter 166 of Massachusetts General Laws and any additions hereto or amendments thereof. Application is hereby received for a poll petition and wire locations from Eversource to relocate and or install poles, wires, cables, and fixtures, including the necessary sustaining and protecting fixtures along and across the following public ways. Number one, install handholds and underground primary beginning approximately 830, excuse me, 843 feet and 930 feet southerly of center line of University Drive, Amherst, Mass, 01002. Number two, install underground primary in conduit approximately 595 feet southerly of center line of Amity Street, Amherst, Mass, 01002. A public hearing will be held by the Amherst Select Board on November 13th, 2018 at 7.15 p.m. in the Town Room Town Hall for Boltwood Avenue, Amherst, Mass. I've read that about as fast as humanly possible. <laughs> Impressive. But really the short story is there's going to be a liquor license hearing and a hearing relative to uh, some work that Eversource is going to do in the Amity and University Drive locations. So if you uh, are interested in those, that'll be uh, the next time we meet, which is uh, November 13th. Um, I do have a couple of other things. On Thursday night, the 1st of November, will be a housing forum. Uh, I will give some brief opening remarks, and then I will have to exit. I will not be able to stay for that, but I hope to encourage anyone who's watching at this point or, or uh, at all interested or concerned or thinking about uh, affordable housing in town that they come to that. Uh, there'll be some significant discussion of a variety of topics, including East Street School location, um, I'm trying to think of the other thing that I wanted to mention. Um, still working on some things relative to uh, conversations with PVTA and root restoration, so I should have some decidedly more detailed information for you at our next meeting. It wasn't quite ready for this evening. Um, 
So those are things that are in the mix on Sunday. I had the distinct pleasure of uh, presenting the Boston Post cane to Fred Filios, who is turning 100 tomorrow. Um, interestingly, one of several siblings in his family to live to 100 or more years, which was fascinating and also uh, incredibly amazing. Um, so that was a, a you know a real joy to to have an opportunity to spend some time with with uh, some folks from Amherst proper, but also surrounding communities. And so that was a nice event to go to, and uh, a real pleasure to be at. Um, I think those are the main things I had as far as uh, member reports from from me. And so, if there isn't anything else to be mentioned or discussed this evening, then I would. Yes. I have a quick question, actually, for the town manager to follow up on that just occurred to me. Sorry, um, I want to go home, too. Is the Keefe Campus Center pub, so we're just thinking about, you know, we've just went through this liquor license thing, obviously, and this will be a new location where there has not, at least in anyone's memory, been such a place. Maybe there was decades ago. But given that, so this, what am I even trying to say? I'm in a hurry. ZBA? Normally we say, oh, well, the ZBA is going to figure all this stuff out over here. We want a general sense of the floor plan and that you've got a place set aside for storage and, you know, it has to go through ABCC. So we kind of look at it, see if we understand it, see if we understand the control process with the IDs and drink pass passing. But we know that the ZBA is like really dealing with all the structural issues, but they're not. Or are they at Amherst College? I don't think they are, but that's a really good question. Yeah, I'll I don't, talk to the building They're kind of like our backup. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> for, no, it's a really good point. For structural <laughs> stuff. Because they don't and, think uh, they need that. Right. But because of the zone that they're in. But let me ask the building commissioner about that, because if not, then you're going to want to know about all that stuff. Or at, at least ask them tons of questions that yeah. indicate yeah. we yeah. sort of know about point. that stuff. Thank you for bringing that up. Any other questions for the manager or any other things? If not, then I think we've probably gotten to the place where we could take a motion to adjourn. And move to adjourn. Second. Is there further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 And so we're adjourned at 939.